pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Father, we thank you for this wonderful community and all the blessings that you bestowed upon us. We pray that you teach us humility, knowing that with humility comes civility. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, Mr. Taylor. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, board members. Um, first item of business is the approval of your agenda. There is one item in the bullpen that regards the appointment of Hamza Atif to the Rappahannock Area Youth Services and Group Home Commission. Can we get a motion to approve with the bullpen? Motion to approve. I have a motion by Mr. Marshall uh, to approve the agenda plus the bullpen item. I'm gonna try this electronic stuff again. Motion passes 6-0 with Mr. McLaughlin being absent. Public presentations. Public presentations. Amy, do we have folks signed up? Yes, sir. Guidelines for public presentations are as follows. Public presentations are opportunities for citizens to present matters you believe deserve the board's attention. These presentations are not part of a public hearing. Sign up to speak at each public hearing is separate. Public presentations are one-way comments from citizens to the Board of Supervisors. This is not a forum for dialogue or for debate. To make a public presentation, please sign up on the provided sign-up sheet and please print clearly. Come to the lectern when your name is called and clearly state your name and your voting district for our record. Address your comments directly to the Board. State whether you're speaking on your own behalf, in which case you'll have three minutes to speak, or on behalf of a group, in which case you'll have five minutes to speak. Uh, the green light on the podium means uh, you are speaking. Yellow means you have 30 seconds to sum up, and when the red light comes on, the microphone will be turned off. Public presentation shall not be used to address matters subject to public hearings or to make political campaign speeches, private advertisements, or personal attacks. Your written comments are always welcomed by the Board of Supervisors. Amy, who is first to speak? Emmett Marshall. As Mr. Chairman, I will make this very short. I would like to ask everyone who opposed to changing our health insurance to stand. That's all I have to say. You can see. Thank you. There are no other citizens signed up to speak. Is there anybody that did not sign up? For the public presentations that wishes to speak at this time? Seeing none, we'll close public presentations. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That brings us to the approval of your consent agenda. May I have the floor computer, please? Tonight's consent agenda is as follows. First is approval of the May 22nd and 29th and June 12th, 2018 board meeting minutes. Number two is acceptance of a budget adjustment and appropriation of FY 2019 Department of Criminal Justice Services Edward Byrne Justice Assistance Grant. This is for a social media policy development and training. It's a grant of $10,458 for which there is no local match. Item three is an adjustment to the FY 2018 revenue budgets to match up with the third quarter revenue projections. Fourth is appointment of Ms. Lisa Phelps to the Transportation Committee as the school's representative for a term that expires June 28th of 2019. Next is the approval of a contract with Superion LLC. This is for our public safety system at a cost of $1,341,645.60. Item six is the approval of a contract modification for renewal uh, with Telephone Answering Service, Inc., doing business as Hildrup Taxi and Virginia Cab. For this, for transportation services, this is the fourth and final renewal of a contract that's been in place for a few years. 
Item seven is the approval and award of contracts to six vendors for wastewater tre treatment chemicals uh, through July 31st of 2019, and the contract may be renewed thereafter for five additional one-year terms. Item eight is the approval of a contract modification for renewal to Welsh Graham and Ogden Insurance for property liability accident and disability insurance services for our FREM volunteer personnel. This is the third renewal of four available under the existing contract. Item nine is the approval of a purchase order to Musco Sports LLC for lighting installation services for Marshall Park at a cost of $220,713.29. Item 10 is to authorize the sale of 2018 uh, bonds and authorize a related public hearing. Item 11 is a commendation recognizing the Virginia State champions of Spotsylvania High School baseball team. Item 12 is a partial appropriation of the FY 2019 adopted budget and the item added it on the, from the bullpen is the appointment of Hamza Hastif to the Rappahannock Area Youth Services and Group Home Commission for a term that expires July 1st of 2019. That's your consent agenda. Any board members want any items removed? Number four, please. Number four. Dr. Trample. Uh, I'd like <clears throat> the bullpen item pulled off of the consent agenda, and I'd like number 11 pulled off. All right. Can we get a motion to approve all but four, the bullpen and 11? So moved. All right. Motion by Mr. Yakubowski to approve the agenda minus number four, the bullpen item, and number 11. Uh, gentlemen, can you vote again, please? <laughs> Motion passes five to one with Dr. Trampy voting no and Mr. McLaughlin being absent. All right. Uh, Mr. Skinner, for number four. <clears throat> yeah, number four, uh, the approval of Lisa Phelps to the Transportation Committee. There's been a couple things brought to my attention. Number one is we've never had the school involved in our Transportation Committee as they're not in part of building the roads, nor are they, you know, have anything to do with it. And n number two is um, I wanted to know if this was officially uh, acknowledged by the school board that uh, that she be appointed as their representative. And I believe that has not happened yet, folks. Nobody uh, checked, and I checked with the board members, and they said nobody ever acknowledged or appointed her to this position. Other than that, I don't see there is a need for a school or representative to be on the Transportation Committee. Mr. Chair. Mr. Ross. Mr. Skinner, the, uh, when the Transportation Committee was set up, uh, as you well know, the bylaws have the membership that include a school board member, and I believe we have had a school board member on in the past, um, before, you, before you were on it, because you recently came on, uh, but it's been an open vacancy that's been sent out with our vacancy list for quite some time now, and the last time that there was a school board member appointed, it was just from the board in general, not something that the school board sent over that's to, that's to my knowledge so, uh, we, we've had an open vacancy we've had no takers it's been there for all board members to see it's been filled by a school board member in the past I oh, do you know I, who I that member that, was I'd like to find that out do you know because you, you yeah um, it, it was Don Upico the head of transportation for the schools and the schools sent that over um, as their person that they wanted on there but that um, was sent by the schools as a right yes recommendation right okay I, I think this is something that we need to go back to the school board and ask them if this is what they want. I mean, 
whether it's open or not, but I think one reason is they, they don't know that there's a member on this transportation board. If there is, that represents a school. And if it is, I think if they knew that and we want one on them, I think it would be the job of the school board to appoint that person. Mr. Chair. Mr. Ross. I, I wouldn't see why they wouldn't know with Mr. Upperco filling the position in the past and Upper Co Mr. Upperco not being on that and that spot being vacant, they should fully be aware of it. Skinner. Mr. Epico is actually part of the staff, the administrative staff there too, that, that is part of that. And I can understand why they want to do that and everything. But for a board member who really has no idea what the transportation issues and stuff and why the school needs to be involved is. Now, if they want to assign another person, Epico, to replace him or the board thinks that Lisa is appropriate for that position and the board approves it, I will be glad to go along with that. Mr. Skinner, I object to that you're judging what the board member knows or doesn't know about transportation, that's a, that's a step, I think, too far. And I believe if we could look up the bylaws, maybe we can table this for till the end of the meeting. I believe the actual membership is for a school board member. Uh, I'm not positive of that, but I think it is. It, it, um, I, I don't know, Carl, if you know that off the top of your head. So, I mean, in the past, if that was filled by Mr. Upperco, but do you know off the top of your head? Yeah, I, I, I turn to the uh, Transportation Committee bylaws here, and it, it says a representative from the Spotsylvania County School District. Okay. So it doesn't have to be a board member. doesn't have to be a board member. Okay. I think we put that on there at one time because Mr. Epico, he was part of the staff, and he had a lot of – I'm not putting Lisa down or anything, but in my recollection, and, and yes, you've had one on there, but – it's What's the purpose of having the school representative on that? Well, I think the reason, and Mr. Yakubowski, if you want to explain, because I think this was part of your original setup, which I think it's a great idea that the, uh, the school system have somebody on, because I, I receive, I'm not on the school board, and I receive complaints quite frequently about the buses and where they're going and what kind of roads are county roads and state roads and private roads. So I think, uh, you know, Mr. Yakubowski set it up. I think it's a great idea to have some school board, school representation on the transportation committee. That's what I'm assuming what happened and why they were included. And I don't know, Chris, if you want to elaborate on that. No, I, I will. Thank you, um, and thank you. It, it was a good idea, and it still is. And because <laughs> our uh, school bus drivers, as as a group, drive our roads the most of any other group in the county. And so if we can get the information from them about where there are issues, where there are problems, we can funnel that into what we're doing with our transportation uh, system so that we can address the issues before they get to be uh, a real problem. So it was really just having more communication with people that are out there constantly and driving our roads. And, and the reason Mr. Apico wasn't put back on, I'm not sure, but I do know that um, didn't we have a time with the transportation committee where there was a lapse and a bunch of people weren't on there we didn't it, it kind of just sort of fell apart a little bit not not because of any certain reason it's just we forgot to reappoint and all that kind of stuff so he might have just got lost in the shuffle but I, I would prefer to ask the school board who they recommend if they want a school board member that's fine if they want staff that's fine but um, I, I would like to get their input and have them be a, a uh, participant with us in the transportation committee. Ms. Ross. I'd like to make a motion to approve. I mean, this if this spot hadn't been vacant for um, at least a year, I, I would feel differently, but it, it has. And if it fails to be approved, then I guess we could go back and ask who they want. But we have a volunteer who is actually an active school board member that is interested in this. and I. In a vacant spot that's been there vacant for a year, so my motion is to approve uh, Ms. Phelps for the Transportation Committee. All right, motion by Mr. Ross to approve the nomination of Ms. Phelps. I would like to make a substitute motion. All right. I'd like to I would like to make a motion that we table this for 30 days and get an input from the school board if this is what they want and this is what they need. Right. We've got a substitute motion by Mr. Skinner to table this for 30 days until we get a response from the schools. Is that good enough? Basically what you said? Yes, that's fine. All right. Go ahead. And, any other comment? Come vote. Oh. <laughs> 
Motion fails uh, four to two with Mr. Benton, Mr. Marshall, Mr. Ross, and Dr. Trampy voting no. All right, now we have Mr. Ross's uh, motion to appoint Ms. Phelps to the Transportation Committee. Motion passes four to two with Mr. Skinner and Mr. Yakabowski voting no. All right. Dr. Trampy, you have the bullpen pulled and number 11. I guess we'll start uh, with the bullpen. The bullpen item I move to approve. I pulled it so that I could vote yes. Okay. All right. Motion by Mr. Sk Dr. Trampy to approve the appointment of. Uh, Hasmus Atif to the Rappahannock Area Youth Services and Group Home Commission. That was the bullpen, 13. Well, it'd be 13. The Motion passes 6 0. All right. Now we have number 11. The if, if we could, ma'am, Mr. Taylor, read the uh, resolution for the state championship. Happy to, proud to, Mr. Marshall. It's a resolution of commendation for the 2018 Virginia High School League Class Three State Boys Baseball Champions. Whereas the Spotsylvania High School folks, please come forward so that you can have and, and, and hear this reading if you would. Gather right up around to the podium here. We are so proud to have the team with us this evening. I think there's at least two Spotsy High School alums present up front here. Yeah. <laughs> Happened during your years. <laughs> now then, commendation of the 2018 Virginia High School League Class 3 State Boys Baseball Champions, whereas the Spotsylvania High School baseball team completed an outstanding season by winning the 2018 Virginia High School League Class 3 State Boys Baseball Championship, and whereas the Spotsylvania High School Knights varsity baseball team is comprised of 18 players and three coaches, Whereas the Knights defeated Hopewell High School in the state quarterfinals 5 to 2 and the Brentsville District High School in the state semifinals 8 to 6 to advance to the state finals. And whereas the Knights defeated Abingdon High School 13 to 8 in extra innings at Salem Memorial Stadium in Salem, Virginia on June 9th, 2018 to win the state championship title. And whereas the Abingdon Falcons were ranked fifth in the state and the Spotsylvania Knights were ranked 51st, and whereas the Knights finished the season with a 21-5 record, bringing home the first state baseball championship title in Spotsylvania High School's history, now therefore be it resolved that the Spotsylvania County Board of Supervisors proudly commends and recognizes all 18 players and three coaches and expresses its pride and appreciation for their excellence and achievement. Congratulations. Hey guys, one question. Oregon or Arkansas? <laughs> Come on. Oregon. Oregon. <laughs> Thank you. Poor, poor, poor Arkansas. Yeah. 
They all need to come. Yeah, we need to shoot forward. Stay down there. They want to take a picture. Sure. <laughs> Single eighteen. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't even been hit the dump yet. Sounds good. Congratulations, <sighs> fellas. <clears throat> good job, guys. Excellent. Good job, coach. We haven't passed the resolution yet, so we probably want to do that. <laughs> Make a motion to approve the resolution as read. <laughs> All right. Motion by Mr. Marshall to approve the resolution as read. Motion passes 6-0. Bring us to board reports, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Skinner, I'll start down towards you if you want. Yeah, I'd just like to mention that uh, in the Lees Hill District and Battlefield, too, there's been a lot of um, <coughs> tearing up the roads and paving new roads and everything. And uh, they tell me now that it should be done this Friday. At the very latest, will be on Monday for the paving and everything else. They've done the entire mine road out to Benchmark Road. And that they will have another, I believe it's 10 days, to go ahead and put the white lines, yellow lines where needed on it and everything else. And I know there's been a lot of uh, uh, a lot of traffic jams out there, and I just uh, tell people that uh, we can't please everybody. They're doing a great job laying a new road, and it, it did interrupt some people's plans and stuff like that, and I apologize for that, but at least now we've got some new roads out there that will serve us for a long time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Right. Mr. Marshall? Nothing to report. Dr. Trampy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm... I'll, I'll follow up with staff, but uh, among the many drainage problems we've been having in the county, uh, right behind Chancellor High School and Chancellor Middle School, uh, the road behind there is getting flooded. So number one, I wanted to ask if VDOT will help since it concerns a road. And number two, apparently the relief pipe coming from the schools is is the main part of the problem. So I was wondering who owns that? Do we own that? Is there something we can do? And but I don't need an answer right this minute, but that'll be just something I'll be discussing with staff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right. Mr. Yakobowski. Thank you. Uh, two things. One I had brought up at the last board meeting a couple weeks ago about directing the CBRC to look at uh, individual county departments and using federal and state mandates as, as a baseline and then build up from there. Uh, I had brought it up at the time and um, said that I'd be bringing it back in two weeks for a vote from the board to direct the CBRC to do that. Uh, the rationale behind that is, uh, as I was talking with the CBRC member, they did say that it is a, a huge undertaking to look at a uh, $500 million plus budget. And when you have board members come and go, uh, since they are volunteers, um, then they have to be brought back up to speed. And so it takes a lot of, um, the learning curve is very, very large for them. And so uh, 
in in trying to get them focused on um, doing doing something that that they can uh, finish, as opposed to trying to bite off the entire budget. Uh, I was uh, going to put it forward that we ask them to begin to look at an individual department, uh, build it up, see uh, the efficiencies that are there that are lacking, uh, some that we might need, and then also compare ourselves to our peer counties, see how we're doing. And then that way we can take it in, in little chunks and start looking at the budget and hopefully be able to also set up a process so that when you have CBRC members come and go, the new ones that come in, there's already a process set up that they can bring themselves up to speed and we wouldn't have such a, um, a dysfunction uh, with, with the committee and it can actually uh, serve its purpose and actually um, uh, hopefully be able to find uh, efficiencies in the budget. So I would like to make a motion that we direct the CBRC to begin to look at individual county departments uh, and use federal and state mandates as a baseline and also compare to um, our peer counties. All right, any discussion? Seeing none, uh, we have a motion by Mr. Yakubowski to direct the CBRC to look at mandates. Uh, what else was there? Well, to uh, look at individual county departments and use federal and state mandates as a baseline and compare to our peer counties. All right, Amy, you got that one? I wrote it down if she needs it. <laughs> Thank you. All right. We can vote. Motion passes 6-0. Uh, thank you. The other item that I had was uh, read in the paper this past week about the improvements that uh, FAMPO is putting in for smart scale for the I-95 north at Massaponics uh, interchange. Um, I don't remember, and perhaps FAMPO did come and say that they were going to do a study because this was a quick study from what I hear. Uh, the thing that's frustrating about this is this is now, including their study, this is now the at least second to third study that's been done in that area. Uh, uh, VDOT had come to us with the super ramp idea. We bought into it. We put it out to the, the voters as a bond uh, referendum idea, and we have started doing portions of that. A portion of that was an improvement of the I-95 northbound uh, intersection or, or interchange. And now we have another study with another idea, and yet we are, have already bought into the super ramp. And so my question is, is the super ramp dead to VDOT because we have already allocated money towards it? And if, if not, why are they doing something outside of the plan that we already had we have now moved into a new plan with a new idea. Why not just continue on the plan that the county has already put a lot of money into, and we had assumed this is the plan that we were going forward. So, if um, our members on V or I'm, I'm sorry on Fampo can uh, report back to us any of those answers, if you can get them, please, uh, or if you have them now, I would certainly appreciate it. Yep. I think it's Ross. So um, the super ramp's still there. It's just a cost thing, and this was. It's more of like a phased approach where they broke it down into different phases. And I do agree with you because there was another study that was presented to FAMPO at our last meeting about the northbound. Uh, and, and I'm not sure where the funding's coming from this, but it is, it, it doesn't, the northbound ramp, what they're proposing now and the modifications to it do not take away from anything else. Uh, it, it, so. it was my understanding from the paper that it was a uh, application I, for smart scale. I didn't, yeah, and I did not read, I didn't read the, what the okay. paper said yet, so. If no, you that, that's give me fine. a chance to read up on that, I, I no, I, with you. I would appreciate that because because if it is a smart scale project, why are we leapfrogging over stuff that we already had, you know, ready to roll? It, Mr. Chairman, it, Mr. Marshall, if I recall, if you look at our smart scale projects that we submitted from Spotsylvania County, also that 126 ramp is that project's also included with what the county submitted, along with what FAMPO submitted. It's been submitted by both entities. We, we submitted the on Route 1 North to I-95 northbound improvements? In, no. I, I'm pretty sure it was on the... It's, know, it's, hard, to, it's hard to call because we get four, FAMPO gets a mix, uh, so and then Fredericksburg gets four, and 
and they all come together there, and then Fred Bus gets four, which I don't even know what theirs are yet. You, you had a number a number of questions though with that. Do you have them where you can send them to either Mr. Ross, yep. if, Mr. Mr. Jacobuski? Marshall. If you send me your questions, uh, Mr. Marshall, and I can get back with you on it. Yeah. Okay. I'll do that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Along that line too, yeah. please. That exit coming west on 17, just prior to 95. Um, that was a big thing there. If, you, if you're coming from uh, the VRE and you get to 95, then there's that trailer court on the right side there. There was a plan there that actually would allow you to go down, parallel, get on 95. And if you stay to the right, you will continue on Route 1. And if you stay to the left, you will go north on 95. Just as Potomac Mills, you've been up to Potomac Mills heading south, they've got that. You can get off or you can enter back on to 95. And, and when we looked at the study, I mean, that saves a lot of cars going on Route 1, which is the problem that we have right now, because the uh, level of service in two years uh, is going to be so bad, you know. And that's, again, my point is, we, we throw this out as a bond referendum, and I, I do know that smart scale is there, but I think smart scale needs to be used for things that you can use in six years. You're planning for that up there, but these are, these are stop gaps. We've got to stop the traffic. We've got to find some way to distribute this, this travel. And I do appreciate the one you submitted from uh, Spotsylvania Avenue up to Jimena. Uh, between that one and the uh, on-ramp off of 17 uh, would seriously take away a lot of traffic on Route 1. So just to remind you. Do you have I, further for your board report? No, I'm done. Thank you. Mr. Ross? I would like to thank uh, Pat Marshall from, the trans from our uh, transportation department. Uh, she's worked with me this past couple of weeks and with the transportation staff to get some signs put up on Rutherford and Tuning Lane. So I'm, I'm thankful for that. She really went above and beyond. And uh, working with constituents, it was uh, outstanding. Um, I'd like everybody to have a happy 4th of July next week. Uh, remember that freedom's not free. and I, Please take some time with your family to celebrate the independence of the greatest country in the world, the United States. And last but not least, we have, I'm sure there's going to be an announcement made, maybe, maybe not, that the Stars and Stripes is this Saturday out here uh, with fireworks from 3 to 11 p.m. It's just a wonderful family event. So I look forward to seeing everybody out. That's all I've got. Hey, Storm of thunder. I'll leave it alone. No report. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Taylor. All right, that brings us to public hearings, Mr. Benton, and that is if we have public hearing tonight on the proposed amendments to County Code Chapter 12, Article 7. This is the towing amendments to the towing ordinance. All right, we'll go ahead and open the public hearing for the uh, proposed amendments to the County Code Chapter 12, Article 7, Towing Ordinance. Uh, hello again. Uh, again, First Sergeant Briner with the Spotsylvania Sheriff's Office, also the Chairman of the Towing Advisory Board. Uh, Mrs. Desnoyer is our County Attorney that has assists us with our legal uh, opinions and guidance. And Mr. Stevens, who is um, one of the members of the board also and um, owner of uh, Coleman's Towing. And also Deputy Cragget, who is our compliance office, one of our compliance officers. Uh, Senior Deputy Noakes, unfortunately, a uh, family matter came up, so he was not able to be here tonight. Um, and, but we do have some answers to some questions that had um, been brought up by some board members that we're going to address. Um, and also up in front of you, we can see the summary of our very lengthy presentation <laughs> that we had two weeks ago. The floor, um, floor computer, please. The floor <laughs> computer, please. Um, so... Um, in one slide, we basically condensed down everything that we went over uh, two weeks ago. So, um, is it a <coughs> okay? So um, that's our introductions. I turn it over to the board to uh, administer the public hearing. Yeah. Uh, 
do we have uh, anybody signed up to speak? Yes, sir. Chris Shanks. Hey, uh, good evening, <coughs> Chairman, uh, Board Members. My name is Chris Shanks. I uh, live here in Spotsylvania. We're on uh, Red Hill Road. Not quite sure what voting district that is, but uh, so. Excuse my car. Yeah. Is this thing on? Thank you. <laughs> All right. So my name is Chris Shanks. I live here in Spotsylvania. I live uh, Red Hill Road. I'm not quite sure what uh, voting district that is. Uh, so, in regards to the proposed uh, changes to the towing ordinance, uh, about four years ago, uh, the Board of Supervisors met, I guess at the uh, direction of the Towing Advisory Board, and there were a lot of changes made to the policy at the time. Uh, some of the significant changes uh, were was pricing, uh, rates that we charge uh, the end user for our services. And so at this point, <clears throat> we now have about a 30-page uh, proposed towing ordinance. <coughs> and nowhere in here have we uh, revisited our rates or, or even proposed a rate change. Now, again, this was four years ago <clears throat> that this happened. So not even a little bit of a backstory, but here's the story. So four years ago, I had 35 employees. I had 25 registered tow trucks, tags, insurance. My, uh, at the time, my workers' comp was about $110,000 a year, and that's at 7% of, your, of, your, <coughs> of what you're paying your employees. So today I have nine employees, four tow trucks, <coughs> and uh, instead of having six locations, I have two. Uh, now, I'm not saying that this <coughs> is only as a result of this, but I can say that my the rates that we were charging at the time, I'm about 25% less than we were four years ago. So four years ago, we went 25% backwards, and I'm not the only one this happened to. Um, quite a few folks. Uh, you know, moving forward, you know, there's a lot of things in this ordinance that are great, but things that I don't know that everyone takes into consideration when they're doing this. You know, so one of the things we're asking for a requirement is to be on the heavy duty, to be included in the heavy duty police rotation list as a 50 ton rotator. So I don't know how many people have priced out a, a, a 50 ton rotator today besides myself, but I can tell you that one right now, <coughs> fully loaded, turnkey, ready to go, 750,000 bucks. So how do you get 750,000 bucks? Well, you need 25% down. Now they, they do these crazy things with loaning you money. They, they loan you half, half, of the, uh, half of the money on the truck. You still end up paying about the same. So it's about $4,900 a month with $200,000 down. <clears throat> Plus, oh, I forgot the $90,000. That includes 12% for the uh, uh, $90,000 for your federal excise tax, for the, you know, and <clears throat> which folks always say that's the cost of doing business. And this is just one aspect of it. I mean, you know, I'm, <clears throat> tires, insurance. When I started in business, my we had two tow trucks. My insurance a month was $700. When I took the tags off the DMV, I got a refund for $80,000 for the tags of the trucks we turned in. My insurance went from just... You know, sir, from, oh, I'm sorry, but your time's expired. Right. I, yeah. Anyway, thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Thank you. There are no other citizens signed up to speak. Right. Is there anybody else that uh, did not... Come on up. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and board members. My name's Darlene Graham. I live in the Berkeley District at 6827 Morse Road. I am speaking on behalf of the Thornburg Shell and the other towers in our zone. We feel there is no reason that the tow truck drivers should have to have an ID card issued through Spotsylvania County Sheriff's Office. Each tow truck driver already has to have a tow license. Every tow truck driver has to have a background check through the Justice Department at a cost of $137 every two years. Every tow truck driver has to be fingerprinted through Virginia State Police at a cost of $10 every two years. 
we feel this is just another cost that is not needed. As far as changing the rules that each company has to have 75% of the drivers certified, we feel it should stay at 50. The small companies that only have two drivers would have a problem if they, they have a driver to quit. We could hire another driver, but they would not be able to start towing until they were able to take a class, which could be up to a year before that class would be scheduled. To take a class online, it is very expensive. We just ask that you consider uh, not having these IDs and keeping the uh, tow truck drivers at 50% certified. Thank you for your time. Is there anybody else that did not sign up that wishes to speak at this time in reference to this public hearing? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. First of all, you got any comments in reference to some of this, these, these issues? God bless you. Did you need us to respond to any of the issues brought up? Sir? If, if you wish, okay. that's up to you. Um, for uh, the topic that uh, Mr. Shank brought up, that is actually a work in progress. Um, there is actually a subcommittee of the Towing Advisory Board now that's been working for the last several months on looking into proposed rate increases. However, um, during our last board meeting, it was explained to the subcommittee that in order to come before this board to substantiate a rate increase, there's going to need to be some homework done to substantiate why those rate increases would be required. Um, they, there have been some comparisons to different localities on that, but um, Mr. Barnes, who's our citizen uh, representative who's also worked in county government here, sort of explained the process to them of what they probably really need to pull together to, to allow us as a tow board, if we choose to down the road propose rate increase changes, that we would have the information and the backing to support that. Um, that's going to be a little time consuming to do. Um, and we've had these other code changes in, a, in the process for a couple years. So it was decided that we would, it's not that we're discounting looking at increasing rate changes. However, we wanted to get the tow ordinance revisions done to clean it up and get the ID requirement and all that in. And then once we have the information to go and propose rate increases to the board in the future, bring that back at that point. Just a quick question from me. Do you have a timeline for that? I, I do not right now, sir. Um, we are probably not having our next towing board meeting till the fall. Um, and that should give the committee ample time to pull that together. Um, and actually, I need to probably touch base with them and figure out what the progress they're making on that. Okay. But. Mr. Marshall. Mr. Chairman, if I could ask one quick question. The requirement to have, the, to be on the heavy duty towing list if, is correct. You have to have a 50 ton rotator to be on that heavy, heavy duty towing list. We, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, I know Coleman, you used to have a, you, yes, you've got a heavy duty record that's not a rotator. No, we have. Yeah. So the way this came about was the tow board didn't want to go and tell the towers what they needed. So we formed a ad hoc committee of all the heavy duty towers. They met together and then they looked at what the state regulations coming forward will be and stuff like that. And that's how this came about. It wasn't that people owned them and said, oh, let's, let's do this. It was more so along the lines of trying to be preemptive to what the state requirements are. And, and yes, it's, it's piloting now in Richmond, uh, Hampton Roads, and all of the 81 corridor that is a 50 ton rotator minimum to be on the list. And the rotator is just an articulating boom on a tow truck. Right, I, I, know, I know exactly what it is. So, so the, the difference is that, yes, a, a new rotator will cost you anywhere between five hundred and twenty and $700,000. Right. That's a new one. So with, with the proposed change to the ordinance with the, adding the heavy-duty towing requirement, the company that doesn't own a rotator, which I don't think, I'm thinking there's only two companies in Spotsylvania County that have them. So currently, the, the heavy-duty towers that are currently on the list, there are three, and all three have a 50-ton or greater rotator. Right. Do we have other companies that have heavy-duty records that are not rotators? Yes, we have. There's many companies, but they are not 
on Spotsylvania County's uh, heavy duty tow list. And if we need it, you know, if, if we needed a rotator, we could request a rotator. We, you know, if that's if that's the case. C correct. So with the contract, we explain to dispatch what what we have, and they let the they let the tow company know, and they will bring whatever appropriate equipment they need. Because you know the the ad hoc deputy may not know I need this that or the other. So we explain to them what we have, and we let the tow companies make a determination if they have that equipment. If they do not, if they're a light duty wrecker um, service, and they they get the call and they can't handle it, then it would need to go to a heavy duty um, tow co tow company. Um, but obviously, if it's a tractor trailer, right off the bat, we know. But there's some vehicles sometimes that can get even a little confusing about whether you need a heavy duty or whatnot. But so the way the way it is proposed now, you're only going to have three three people three companies on the list. Right. So the way un only three. right. Okay. So the, a resolution the same year that the resolution was passed for the um, the rates that the board adopted that we're just incorporating into the ordinance. That same day, there was also a resolution by the board that set a cap on the number of record companies that we would have. We would have 12, um, zone 56, 57, did I get that right? Which is, we have two light duty zones in the county. Right. And then we have uh, zone 59. Is that, is that right? Yeah, is, is zone 59 is heavy duty. And the county would cap that at four. So we have the potential down the road to have one of our existing light duties if they wanted to upgrade to a heavy, but we are in excess of our light duty because what we ended up doing was there were 18 tow companies at the time. So it, the sheriff and all that and some others discussion, they did not feel it was fair to institute a cap and all of a sudden six companies that have had contracts with us are null and void. So the agreement was that the cap would be set at 12, the 18 at that time would be grandfathered, and then through attrition over time, we would get to the 12 cap. We are now only at 17 companies, because so, since then we've had one company that's been removed and won't be coming back. So there's really no opportunity right now with the cap to have any other new companies add to light duty, but we could have a heavy duty right now. Rotate. Have, having the requirement to have the rotator and have a man spend three quarters of a million dollars to get on a list is uh, is quite an undertaking for anybody in business. There are heavy duty comp There are you're telling me there are companies in Spotsylvania County that do have heavy duty records that are not rotators. So we could add a man to the list possibly um, without having I, a rotator. I can't answer that because I don't know. I know that um, as Mr. Shank spoke, he removed. 20 trucks off the list or, or out of his fleet. So he was who I was speaking of. So he may not own a heavy now. So I don't, I don't have an answer to that. Um, the answer as far as that goes from a rotating articulating boom to a regular boom, you know, to buy a regular tow truck heavy duty right now is $427,000. Right. So yes, you can look at it from a monetary end or you can look at it from a scene management and an incident management end for expedited road openings and stuff like that. And yes, as, as you said before, Kevin, yeah, I was, you know me, I'm, I'm the most anti-rotator person out there. Um, but the state mandated it, so we saw the right on the wall and had to either put up or shut up is how we looked at it. Um, and yeah, we were kind of forced into the situation that we were not ready for. But in the backside of that, I, you know, I will tell you privately that it's saved me a lot of money <laughs> from damages. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> Mr. Chair. Mr. Skinner. So is Mr. Schenk on our 17, one of the 17 that we have him on the list? Yes, he is. He is. So I guess my question, and I don't, is it possible that now that he's got that uh, rotator, heavy-duty rotator, can he be moved into that classification with the other three heavy-duty rotators? Uh, how do you, you know? I wouldn't have that answer. He, we, that would have to come from Noakes, uh, Deputy Noakes, because he's compliance. Uh, that'd be beyond me, beyond the scope of me, okay. as far as it goes. So if we only have three on the list and there's a cap of four, there's a potential to add a company to that list. But okay. they would have to be in compliance with whatever standards are to fulfill the heavy-duty list. 
And as we and as I spoke a couple a couple month, weeks ago, you know, we're trying to we're trying to structure our things for what is to come. Mm -hmm. That's all, it's on the horizon, and so we're trying to be a little proactive. Would you not agree? Um, <coughs> to to get our, our where we need to be at. So if if we have a if we have a vacancy and we're below that cap, and somebody qualifies, we can fill that cap. Um, and we and we have that right now in heavy duty. So is is there a process that Mr. Schink come to the board, to no, the committee, or how, not this board, but no. your committee, and say, look, I've got the requirements now. I've met the requirements. Can I be pushed into that uh, fourth spot? They apply to the sheriff's office for the okay. contract. Our compliance officers go out and they inspect what they have to make sure that they have the equipment and everything that's required to to sign a contract with us to do those tows. And that's where a lot of this stuff that's come in that's been added for heavy duty and all that, this is creating the minimum standards to make sure that these companies have the minimum equipment requirements that they need to do the job and, and are, are aptly equipped. Uh, remember, we are only regulating those tow companies that have contracts with us to do law enforcement tows. So if you're on the side of the road, you can call whoever you want. But if we're going to be involved in that, we, we want to have a, a set standard so we can ensure that those companies that are coming out and servicing the residents and citizens of the Commonwealth, that those, those responding entities um, have the equipment they need and, and on scene or shortly thereafter. And they're not scrambling for stuff or may not have, they may have subpar stuff. That's what we're trying to do with regulating the companies that are under our contract. <coughs> Okay. Do, Mr. Noir, do you know whether Shanks would, if they got a rotator, would be able to go on the floor? Mr. Benton, <coughs> um, well, according to the the revisions in the statute in the ordinance here, he would have to go through the application process, be vetted, um, and if he did all the qualifications and the cap, if there was still room um, under the cap, he. Good. Okay, I, that's he, what I wanted. I just wasn't he was sure. Qualified as long as he passed all the qualifications and there was room, and, and as long as the four slots weren't already filled, he could. Okay. I did want to say one thing too that that the ad hoc committee at the time when it was formed for the tow board because the tow board felt that it wasn't our position to tell the towers what they needed. It consisted of all the heavy duty towers that were on the list. This goes back two years ago now when this process started, but. Uh, it was Shanks, Frog and Toad, Michaels, Coleman's, and Coopers. Every heavy duty tower that was on the list had input into this ordinance. We've not changed anything in the two years that, that since we presented it to Carl. Okay. Yeah, Carl. Uh, and as I mentioned previously to the board, um, the the board sets the cap. Uh, the ordinance does not. So to the extent that you know, uh, those positions are filled up, and there are a lot of businesses wanting to get in uh, uh, to be able to do that. That's something the board, at its discretion at any time in the future, if that ends up being a problem and you want to expand it, of course, balancing that against the sheriff's concerns, you do have the ability to do that in the future at any time. Yeah. And part of the reason the cap, if memory serves correctly, this was prior to my time here, but my understanding, part of the reason the cap was set is to appropriately run a program, a professional program, that is comprehensive, it takes time. Two times a year I send these guys out for two to three weeks at a time to inspect all these tow companies. They audit these companies. Um, if the truck gets a new, if the company gets a new truck in between those two inspections, they go out and inspect those vehicles. They handle my complaints. So any complaint that comes in that may be a violation in the ordinance, uh, they investigate that just like any other investigation. So, having said that, part of the reason a cap was done was to help control so we can manage that. If, if we allow it to run amok, <laughs> um, we're going to need bodies and money to, to run the program. And it doesn't really cost, we don't put out, we don't charge a lot to do for the app and all that stuff, you know. I mean, it, it's, not a, it's not like um, one of the other county departments, they're... Um, utilities, I think, aren't they like they're self-funding off their service fees? Uh, we don't self-fund the tow program off of what, what we get out of that. And um, that, that's the only thing I caution you about opening it up is 
there's going to be some resources on our end that we're going to need to keep up with that. Right. Mr. Chairman, Mr. one more quick question. You're saying that you're trying to get ahead of the state by requiring the heavy-duty record to be to have the rotator requirement. So currently, the state of Virginia does not require you to have a rotator to be considered a heavy-duty record company, correct? So currently, the state doesn't have any regulations in place. They're, they piggyback off of localities um, for the state police and for VDOT. However, VDOT contracts stipulate a rotator. VDOT is also pushing for the uh, TRIP program, which is uh, incident management on the interstates and the main thoroughfares, such as Route 3 and, and Route 1. Um, and the TRIP program is for expedited scene clearance, and that is a mandatory rotator. As a matter of fact, it's a mandatory rotator and a minimum uh, either 25 or 35 ton wrecker along with it. Thank you. Any other comments from the board? On this uh, ID, all right, <clears throat> if the record drivers already have to have a, uh, or tow driver, driver sorry, uh, already have an ID, what's the purpose of the secondary ID? So we had that question before, and I reached out to Deputy Noakes because I wanted to make sure I understood it correctly because Deputy Noakes is, is my expert, so and he couldn't be here. His response to that was the Commonwealth of Virginia requires applications every two years for their dad card. That's what they were talking about, their dad card. A minimal background is performed on these drivers and only one or two persons from the entire Commonwealth of Virginia. Drivers can wait up to three months in some cases to get dad cards. Our contracts are annual and require each that tow companies apply to be on this list. We're adding the ID cards for drivers to report arrests, crashes, and previous criminal convictions, convictions to ensure that we are placing citizens of Spotsylvania County in tow trucks with safe and law-abiding drivers for the safety of everyone. This contract for towing is an extended hand of the Spotsylvania County Sheriff's Office and the Virginia State Police, and we must ensure proper backgrounds on all drivers. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Martin. When you mention a minimum state background check, when you go to get a concealed weapons permit, you're going to get fingerprinted, you're getting a state background check. If you're convicted of a felony where you can't have a firearm anymore, the state's going to pull that concealed weapon permit for you, from you. I would assume the state would also pull, it from, pull that tow truck driver's license if he had a conviction or he was no longer qualified to drive a tow truck. It would work the same way. I don't think there's such thing as a minimum state background check. It's a state background check, it's a state background check. One thing that this requires that the state wouldn't require is, a, um, is that tow truck drivers would be required within 10 days of uh, date of offense or arrest to report things such as DUIs, anything that would, um, would have the potential of suspending or revoking their operator's license, anything, any crimes involving a tow truck, anything like that, that would have to be reported to the sheriff's office for monitoring in, throughout the court process. And that's not something that they would have to report to the to the sheriff's office, so that would provide an additional layer of um, of safety. Or if there would potentially be a problem with these drivers, we we have state laws in effect that take care of that too. When you get pulled over for a DUI conviction, they take the driver's permit, so that's all that's that's handled. Also, they wouldn't have a driver's license, so they shouldn't be driving a car to go get their record. <laughs> that's that's on a second offense, Mr. Marshall. But um, on the first offense, it would have to be reported to the sheriff's office, so so they would be aware that that's a problem with this tower. What's this? Uh, what does this license cost? What's the second license? So obviously, you carry two IDs or five dollars. Five dollars. Oh, okay. I, I was actually going to ask the same question. I, I had never asked what, what is this going to cost us. So. <laughs> so, in addition to what the state requirement is. The county is asking for a five dollar check or an ID that checks those things that would not be checked by the state as far as the, the board can see. And and also my understanding is too, this then gives the ability for deputies on the scene to ensure that the drivers that are coming out on these trucks are supposed to be operating those trucks because they'll have their little ID yeah. card that means they've been registered with us and all that stuff is my understanding from deputy are, are your qual uh, capabilities or uh, on that card does it show whether you're heavy duty or heavy duty with a 
rotator, you know, is that all, it tells you what your classification is yes, that on that was, card? Yes, that was going to be part of it too, because okay. you can't obviously have a light duty operator operating a heavy duty truck. Right. Okay. And that's a total of $5 every two years then? Or? Every year, sir. Every year? Yeah. Okay. There, apparently the discussion came up about the training and the cost of the training. Um, and I, uh, Mr. Stevens leaned over to me and Mr. Neuer did that. The, the minimum training is available free, is that correct? So, yeah, I think we had this discussion last time. So um, the Sheriff's Department themselves um, promote a class every two years in Spotsylvania County, then that, and that one is held for free. Um, the person who holds the class, um, actually the, the two people, because Mr. Hart also assists with it, those two people only be asked to be reimbursed for their expense, which is whatever, their lunch or whatever. So I think they charge a nominal fee of like 10 bucks or so. I can't remember, Jim. 20 bucks, he said, uh, per person, per driver. Uh, to replace their food and whatever else they expense. Um, that, those two classes are, um, we've done two now. One had 76 people and one had 58 people in it. So substantial amount of towers are taking advantage of that. Um, I think um, I'm a, a, I'm probably not the best person to speak about because I'm a huge proponent of education, um, regardless of what that education is. So um, I'm probably a little biased to be answering this because I am a, a, a nationally recognized trainer, actually North America, so I do a lot in Canada also. Um, so I'm probably not the best person to answer this question for you because I'm, I'm biased. I think the training is crucial in our industry, and I think that, you know, it's, it's imperative that um, a tower doesn't make a mistake at uh, 3 a.m. on a back road by himself and run a cable across the road and decapitate three or four people. I think that stuff is, is crucial to our industry. But this is the transportation industry, and if you've paid attention to the news, you notice that the transportation industry is incredibly hard and, and starving for new talent, new operators, and, and, and uh, drivers. So it's a it's a it's a it's a positive and a negative there. So um, yeah, it's it's it, it. But the training can also get quite expensive um, from the heavy duty aspect. Uh, 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 me and another company go in every year to well every other year together and we hire a trainer to come in because it's you know illegal for me to train my own company so i'm unfortunately not able to take advantage of this free training that spotsylvania offers but i still have to get my guys trained so i i pay that fee and again i'd like to reiterate this is just tow companies that are on our list i mean you can have a tow company in this county and it doesn't necessarily even have to meet all these standards. But these are the standards that we're trying to instill with those agencies that are in contract with this county, the sheriff's office, to tow vehicles. So. Mr. Marshall? Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make the motion to approve the proposed amendments with the removal of the ID county ID cards, and also I would like to leave the required number of certified tow truck drivers at 50% instead of 75%. With those two changes to the uh, amendments, I would like to a motion to approve it. Mr. Mr. Chair, um, uh, Mr. Marshall had, had indicated that he uh, would possibly have those issues, so we've drafted those changes, um, and they are highlighted uh, in addition, because the whole thing's redlined, so it's additional redline, but we've highlighted those changes for you. So uh, one packet will be the, uh, the removal of that ID requirement. The second is uh, the uh, changing it from uh, the 75 percent back to the 50 percent. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have Jessica hand those out. Amy will have those for the public, so you all will see and for the record, it'll be exactly what the language is that you're voting on. Right. Should you all adopt it again? Mr. Skinner, you have a comment? Yeah, I, I do. And it's, it's to you, Kevin. And that is, so when we originally thought this uh, second ID was like a, over $100 to get, but what we're talking about, the $5 fee then, to put an ID card out there that shows what qualifications that Spotsylvania driver has? And that's going to be cost. That's going to cost five dollars, if I understand. Is that correct? 
Okay. Did you? So it's a five dollar fee. It's a five dollar fee, and with that extra five dollars, we get pretty much a um, quality control as far as when those drivers arrive. And I'm not saying that you know we got a state. Um, multiple people probably uses trucks, you know, the same truck over and over. So um, I, I think it's a benefit to the county for that five dollars to make sure that we have just a little bit more quality control for the people on the road out there. And if, if I misunderstood, I, I, please I tell don't me. know. I don't know how much more quality control you're looking for. They've got a sticker on the side of the truck. They've got a state certification in their pocket, and they have a county deputy on scene because they're the ones who cause the tow truck driver to be there. You can't get much more safer than that. Um, the, I, if you read through the line, I think if you read through it even more, you, you have to have that county ID the way it was written also if we were to approve it. You, if the man showed up and didn't have it, you could turn him away. And uh, I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, fire, fire chief sitting in the back right there, I'm pretty sure that if he had a fire truck that was – working an accidental 522 in Mr. Benton's district and the man didn't bring his car, they wouldn't be too happy about waiting another hour for a tow truck driver to come out there um, over a five-dollar card. Um, but that's, I think I'll say, that's my two cents on it. Okay, I just because I, you know. All right. Motion by Mr. Marshall for the approval minus the five-dollar card and to keep the ed education at 50%. And that, okay. as reflected in the uh, the documents we just handed out. As reflected in these documents. Couldn't vote. I'm hitting this damn thing. Motion passes 6-0. Mr. Skinner? I, I would like the board to do one thing. I, I think from this point on, when you reduce that $5 ID, can, can you keep a record of if we would have had that card, we might have had, you, you see what I'm saying? What uh, occurrences will happen from this out? Where if they had that $5 card, fines would be good. Now they don't have it. Could you keep a log of what, the, you see what I'm trying to, I don't know how you do that, but the point is when you go out there and if that $5 is really serving the county, then maybe we need to relook at it at a later date. But right now it's not. I would like to know how that will affect the tow truck, the, 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 the I service. Look, I can look into that and Please. see. Uh, but I, I do agree it, it might be difficult to figure out because we're not carding anybody and we don't know. So as long as they're dab good, they're dab good, dab card good, if any other issues come up in that two years, I mean, we're not going to know. The deputy on the side of the road is not going to know. So, uh, you see what I'm saying? I, I can ask for you, but and we can get back to you on that. But well, first, Sergeant, couldn't you? Couldn't the deputies just ask the name and law of the driver at the, the time and log it with in the CAD notes? That way, Mr. Noakes and I forgot your name, but I'm sorry, Ratchet uh, could check or, or verify drivers and stuff like that. They're that doing appropriate things. Are you asking if they have, they're they required to have their DAB card? No, I'm, I'm talking about if, if I don't know if I understood it right or not, what Mr. Skinner was saying, but where this ID thing that we were wanting, at one, that's now not going to happen, um, to see if there's any issues where you can log, you know, get a statistical information that you can pull, you just tell the deputy to, log the name in the towing company that was called at the time, they can go back and pull that information off CAD and verify that information, you know, that the right driver's driving the right truck and nobody was coming in a heavy duty, which shouldn't be doing a heavy duty. And because with their interactions with the companies, uh, as much as they are, I, I would assume they have a idea of what's going on. So it'd like you'd be going back and auditing the list of yeah, you all can, the people. You can yeah. do a quick audit. Go ahead. I think that can just be incorporated in the audit. We all get audited now, so I'm, I'm not so sure that couldn't be part of the audit because we have to supply every six months, thanks to John and Steve, we have to supply <laughs> every single driver, every 
uh, social security number, every T number, every D, uh, dad number, everything. So I think that I think that should be fairly easy to do. Um, yeah. I mean, if the deputy is simply just noted in CAD the driver's name, that's all you, I mean, should have to do. And, and, and I know everybody's calling it a $5 <coughs> card. Um, I mean, I don't, I'm not a county employee, so, you know, it's an ID card to me. I don't, you know, I, some ways yes, some ways no to me. I don't have a vested interest in that. Um, but I do think that um, it is important that we at least keep focus to the fact that we're <laughs> protecting the citizens of the county, number one. Um, uh, but number two, that, that in transportation is very difficult to get I don't want to, I want to choose my words carefully here, highly qualified operators nowadays. Now we're having to train operators from beginning to entity. So, um, you know, sometimes maybe an ID card would, would be kind of a hindrance for us as far as the education part, because if my operator's not certified in a heavy duty, how do I teach him heavy duty other than being allowed to ride? So <clears throat> I, I would be very open to doing the audit end of it, but I would not want to hinder the companies, be whatever company it is, as far as like this being the deciding factor. Okay. Okay, I just wanted to be clear about that. So I want to make sure I understand, Mr. Skinner, something about logging occurrences where right. without the card, the card would have been a benefit. Is that correct? What I'm saying is it sounds like me when you said the card allows them to report a DWI and stuff of that, and they're required to report Right, because then it gives okay. some contractual and ordinance. We don't have what? They're not without the ID. That's the only place where it's required. Right, right. Right. So, I mean, that's, I mean it's, it just gave us a little more to be able to no, be I, on top of things a little I, more. I, but. I, I think it's okay to... to uh, you know, I do want to monitor whether or not a person who's got that big heavy ton uh, truck out there is doesn't have a DWI or something of that nature. Um, and and under the state regulations, there's no requirement, I guess, for him to report that to you guys. Well, if he has, or, if he has a conviction, yeah. Right. But, no. And Gary, every six months when they do do this, this checking of the companies, these inspections and stuff, they do run every driver. Okay. Um, every okay. one of them. And so they go through that process now. Okay. Thank you. All right. We'll move to presentations. Thank you all very much. I think you have, unless you have another question for us. I'll get up with Mr. Skinner. <coughs> okay. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Next, Mr. Chairman, board members, we have... Uh, our insurance consultant Lee Deskins here and Leslie Moore from HR. That would be um, helpful to share with the board the same presentation that Mr. Deskins has been giving, given to uh, retirees in connection with the proposed changes to uh, our insurance program for Medicare eligible uh, retirees. And he also has, or Leslie also has some frequently asked questions and some sample scenario information um, to pass out. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Um, as you will recall, um, back in April on the 3rd, you had asked that um, our consultant, Mr. Lee Deskins, would follow up with some in information and examples of how the impact of the health reimbursement plan would affect Medicare eligible retirees. So he has conducted those meetings and he is here tonight with us to share his um, information from those meetings. And we're gonna go ahead and start with the slideshow that was presented um, at the two town hall meetings.
Can we have the floor computer, please? Down on the bottom, you minimized it. Okay, thank you. In advance, I apologize to those of you that have already heard this uh, presentation because I know a number of you were at the uh, Medicare retiree meeting, but we started out uh, welcoming the um, Spotsylvania uh, retirees to the town hall meeting. The next slide. And the purpose of the meeting uh, was to communicate uh, with them the plan being considered by the board to help you understand your specific situation. We believe for the large majority of this, uh, this will be an improvement. But we want to know if this will be better, neutral, or worse for you. After determining your specific situation with your approval, I will aggregate the data based on the cost to you and provide a summary to the board. As background, the board asked for recommendations that would utilize the Medicare subsidies available, which the current plan does not benefit from. They wanted a win-win for the retirees and the county. The current plan does not participate in Part D subsidies, and it also does not get the full benefit of Medicare pricing from hospitals and doctors. We currently offer two Health insurance plans to employees and retirees. Key Care 30 uh, is our standard plan, and Key Care 20 is our buy up premium plan. As you should be aware, Medicare eligible retirees must enroll in both Part A and Part B of Medicare, and there is a separate Part B premium. The current standard premium is $134 per month, but you may be paying a different amount like 104 per month. This is usually taken out of your Social Security check monthly and is in addition to any premium you may pay to the county for coverage or to buy up to KeyCare 20. The plan before the board is a health reimbursement account. The letter uh, that was sent to the retirees indicated it was a Medicare reimbursement plan. It would only be offered to 65 plus Medicare retirees. The plan is not insurance like your current plan. Instead, it allows you to purchase insurance and be reimbursed for the expense. Many types of Medicare coverage are available to individuals. These types include Medicare supplements, Medicare Advantage plans, Part D prescription drug plans, spousal group retiree plans, TRICARE dental plans, and the county has offered to allow you to stay on the current dental plan at $28 per month. Uh, vision, uh, and the vision plans are like $16 a month, and your Part B premium could also uh, be reimbursed. This reimbursement plan will reimburse deductible premiums up to $625 per month. In addition, if your premiums are below the monthly limit, you may use the balances to reimburse drug copayments and vision expenses. Additional details of the plan include $625 will be put into your account on a monthly basis. You may only spend money available in the account. It is anticipated the current active employee FSA administrator will administer this plan, but this is not an FSA or flexible spending account. It does not have a use it or lose it provision, and it does not fund for the entire year at the beginning of the year. You will need to submit proof of premium cost typically once a year or when the premium changes, whichever period is shorter. Premium reimbursement will be available the first day of the month via ACH deposit into your bank. The account may be used by you or your spouse, and this is a new benefit for those who do not use all of their allowance on their own and have a spouse. Any amount not used by 
premium may be used to pay drug and vision expenses. If you die with a balance in the reimbursement account, your spouse may use that balance for up to one year for their premium and drug and vision expenses. If there is no spouse remaining, balances will be returned to the county or if there's balances after that year. Uh, then I ended, I said, I hope this was helpful. Are there any general questions? If you have a specific personal question, please do not ask it in this public setting. One question you may have is, does it matter where or who I purchase this coverage from? And the answer is no, it doesn't. Uh, and when will enrollment start? And I indicated that it will not start before October 15th. Uh, so that was in the totality of the presentation. We then had a number of questions uh, that came up throughout both meetings, and we have provided you with a list of those questions and some, some answers. I Thank you. Um, one of the areas and one of the questions that I was asked, if you'll just turn to um, number 13, um, I was asked if there was any COLA included or any adjustment to the premium, and at the time, um, I had forgotten that the plan was uh, calculated using a 2% uh, CPI adjustment, so there was. I told them, no, there wasn't a COLA at, at that point. So that's just a, I wanted to update you and let you know that, um, that I had indicated um, that it hadn't been planned for. So, so that, that's one change. And uh, another question that has been ask, um, have, which I did not have the information for at the time, number 20, have any other localities made this change in the last three years? And um, Henrico made it um, last year, and there are three, um, four other plans that Flexible Benefit Administrators uh, handles, and three of those were in the last three years. So that would be four plans, and those are localities. Did you have any questions? I mean, I know you are just now reading through those question and answers, so if you have anything that you'd like to ask on that, you may. I also provide an example, and this is not maybe completely um, what was asked for. There were some examples that were given, and I, I don't know the prescription drugs that, like, for example, a 75-year-old male insulin-dependent diabetic with high blood pressure would take, and it depends on which specific drugs that were provided. So what I did provide is a handout showing you that a 75-year-old plus um, male, what they would pay for their premiums, which it shows $242 for a Plan F, which picks up all the copays and deductibles. If you look under the proposed monthly amount, uh, $28 for um, dental, 16 for vision. And then um, I showed what the amount of expense, out-of-pocket expense, would need to be to end up at a zero or neutral position. So uh, that would be $4,068 in a year. And with that, then, th they would end up in a neutral position, assuming that that same individual was not paying any co-pays currently for their prescription drugs. Uh, or, uh, and that their only expenses were $134 for Part B. So that, that's what that sort of shows you. I will report to you that um, at this point there were... Mr. Skinner has a question for you. I'm sorry, go ahead. So let me ask you this. A person, um, is this guaranteed insurance if we, they switch over to those? Many people out there may have current conditions, and uh, so whether they had cancer or right, something that, of that nature, yeah, they're that, guaranteed that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, if their current group plan is terminated, they will have a special election period. And in that special election period, that include, they will have a guarantee issue, and they can purchase a Plan F, which covers copays and deductibles that Medicare doesn't cover, so it's a 100% plan. Uh, they will be able to purchase that with no medical underwriting, no pre-existing conditions. That's correct. And I guess one other question then. So at these ages, and there's many people out there that are fairly senior to me, myself, and and going from what you're doing is really throwing the the 
the requirements on the individual rather than than you do with it. <clears throat> Uh, you know, here's your money, $625 or whatever it is a month. You do with it. And, and you know what? That is very dangerous. Uh, that is very dangerous to do something like that. You said it can be spelled on drugs, spent on some. So do they send the premium into the county and then the county pays that? Or bills for, for... And a problem I have is some people don't have the money to put up front to get the drugs. And so how does that work? If, if I get 625, but I don't, I go to a doctor, I pay the copay or whatever it might be, and then they give me a prescription, but I don't have any money to pay that, buy that prescription. How, how does that work? Okay. Um, the way the plan is designed, uh, premiums that you purchase for the different coverages, which could include the ones that I've listed here, the medical, met, uh, the, the supplement, med Medicare supplement, Plan F, the dental premiums, the vision premiums, the drug premiums, any of those premiums, the Part B premiums, which they currently are paying, but it's but it's coming out of their Social Security check, mm -hmm. okay? So um, so they don't notice that they're paying it, but but they know that they're paying it, the people that I've met with. So um, all of those premiums can be added up, and they would get reimbursed those that amount at the first of each month through direct deposit into their checking account. So they're gonna have the money to pay for the premiums right up front, assuming that the premiums are under $625. So they will have that money up front. The remainder will go on a Visa debit card, which would help them pay for the other expenses out of their pocket, like the co-pays, or, the, or uh, when I say co-pays, there are no medical co-pays. It would be drug co-pays or vision expenses. So, so really, there would be no upfront cost for them. They would receive it in advance. Does that Okay, I, I, I find that very difficult, even at my age. I know there's more seniors out there than me. Right. To, to have to worry about where the money is and what do I pay for, I forgot my credit card and stuff of this nature. I mean, it happens. Um, it's happening to me right now sometimes. And, and so I would, I, would uh, I, I'm, I guess one question I have too before, and I think we may have brought this up. Do we have any numbers on how many people are going to retire in the next 10 years, Mark, from Spotsylvania County, or who are, let's not say who are gonna retire, who are eligible for retirement in the next 10 years? I do not have those numbers in front of me, but I can certainly get those for you. I think that would be very, very important because um, if, if I was out there sitting <coughs> and you guys just told me, I, I want something that's taking care of me. I want something that is automatic. I, if I forget to pay a check or I forget to do this, uh, right now there are many people out there that are used to the, the routine that they do, and they're afraid of having that excess money and stuff of that nature. And so what I, I was hoping that if we can find out who's going to retire either 10 years from now or eligible for retirement 10, make it 15, I don't care. But the point is, when you come into a system and you've worked here all that your life here, I think you want to get what you were promised when you started that job and when you retired. And I would, I, you know, my thought process is, let's find out how many people were eligible for retirement, either 10, 12, 15 years. You're not gonna please everybody. And that's grandfather those people in it and any new employees that are coming on board now will go under your system. And, you know, how does that affect us if we did something like that? cost-wise and because I you know at the beginning of the meeting mr. Marshall stood up and says who's opposed to this there are quite a few people there and, and and you know what as far as the county retires the people that showed up here is quite an amount believe it or not for that type of vote and stuff of that nature right. there's many other people Bobby couldn't make it here or you know doing it right. so I really want to be careful with the people that have worked because this county has been survived through all their efforts throughout the years and I think we as a, a county owe what we said we were going to do for them and uh, um, one thing that you did ask me to do at the last meeting which um, I have begun to do is to um, identify whether or not 
um, the retirees will be um, positively, negatively, or not impacted by this financially. And so I've done that. I've met with over 30, uh, around 30 of those out of 110. And out of those, there was one person that would not be better off with this plan financially. Now, I will tell you this, and, I, and in meeting with them, I understand. Um, they know in the meetings when they ask questions, my parents live next door to me. They're 89. My father just turned 89 uh, in June, and my mother is 87. And I understand that for them to make these kind of decisions, like which insurance plan should I purchase now that it's not being purchased for me, how difficult that is. Um, so I, I believe that of the ones that have seen me that stood, they are in the camp that this is too hard, I can't understand it, and I don't want to make this decision because I know I have worked their numbers and they are positive. It, there's a benefit for them to, to go to this type of plan. Um, but that's just financially, and there's more to this decision as I, you know, as yeah, you can Mr. appreciate. Chair, the only thing I would say is that oh, no. it's, it's... I think Mr. Ross was wanting to question. Still talk? I'm sorry, sorry, Mr. Death. Go ahead. I was just going to say that the reason for that is, uh, you know, you say it's beneficial for them. It's beneficial, but they can't see that, and nor do they want to take that requirement on uh, that to turn over to themselves and stuff of that nature. I'm not against this plan. I think this is a great plan, but I don't think it's for the people that are retired or are going to retire within, let's say, the next 10 years. Okay, and and that gives people plenty of time to know that. And you call the next 10 years, whether or not they do it or not. And, you know, it's a choice if they want to work for this county. But at this age, and your parents would be the same thing. It's not that it's not benefit for them, but they, they don't understand exactly what is the requirement put on that. That's a little scary, especially if you're single. No, I, I, don't, I don't disagree with you. I mean, it is difficult for someone to make decisions, um, especially as they get older. Um, and, and have change. And for example, to have, you know, four cards, you know, a different drug card than they have for their benefit, for their doctor and hospital, those, those are things that would be different. Um, that, that is the way that almost every other Medicare beneficiary in your county currently uh, receives their benefits. So um, while I recognize that it's a challenge to make those changes, um, it's not one that plenty of other Medicare beneficiaries in the county are not familiar with. Um, so, you know, I mean. Thank you. Mr. Ross. So I, I'm not 87 or 89, and I hate trying to figure this stuff out myself. Um, sure. So I, I can sympathize. So you're in a unique position having your parents nearby at 87 and 89. Um, and I think in the past you've offered to help because how, do you have any recommendations? Because I, I see you're, you are uh, recognizing that it's not just, you know, out of 30 people, 29 are financially better off and that you've talked to, that sounds great, but you have recognized that it's not just that decision, it's the change decision and figuring this stuff out. And I'm not 87 or 89, but I don't, I can't figure that stuff out. I have my wife do it. Um, so do you have any recommendations there? And then also for our county employees who would be, if this would go forward, and I'm not saying it will, but if it would, is there support that is it you would be able to provide or somebody from county staff would be able to provide to say they don't understand, they can come in and talk to you, you can help them. Or, or somebody else can help them, they, they still don't understand, they can come back and get help repeatedly until they can get it worked out. Is that an option? So two questions. <laughs> um, I am licensed and can uh, provide these types of services or benefits for, for your retirees. Uh, as could, like it intentionally has been set up so that other uh, licensed individuals in the county, for example, or in the local area would be able to do this or provide this service. So Now, is that done for a fee? I just have to ask. Or is it, it's it free on a commission or? basis. Like it is a commission yeah, basis. Yeah, and all of these products that they would look at, um, not 
obviously the county dental plan, but um, but all of the other products have a commission in them already built in. And when we calculated the rates, we went and looked at each of them. When we looked at the Part D plans that were available to them, they they're the standard premiums for for those. It's now, sta for standard um, without without the county employees, are there commissions for? premiums that others that are not county employees that are retired yes. would all, they would pay the same premiums right. it's they? the same they would pay the same premium they'd have the same plan if they called anthem and, for example the directly fee. or called aarp it would be the same the same yeah. premium and the same fee would be as, right. as what we would yeah. be paying so you're not you would anybody that helps them is not getting an additional no. fee of what anybody else right. would okay thank you that's correct chairman mm -hmm. chairman dr uh, Mr. Taylor, can we look into the possibility of adding some adding a a, uh, a position to our our HR office uh, just for this, at least temporary until it until we get everybody acclimated? Uh, Dr. Trampley, I certainly I think that from the variety of comments received, some help in understanding the complexities and navigating the choices. Um, would would certainly be welcome by a lot of folks. We need to consider the the licensing requirement, the possible parameters, and what we might do in crafting a, uh, a coaching uh, or helping uh, position or role in HR. But I think it could be. Uh, I'd like to explore that possibility and see what we can do because I think it would be uh, fundamental. Um, first of all, it's not just with retirees and Medicare and Medicare supplement plans, but I think uh, I don't personally enjoy figuring out our health insurance as an employee any more than Mr. Ross does. So I think that having a, uh, a competent and uh, aware uh, coach to help uh, retirees with this program in particular would be a good thing as is having good advice available for our employees uh, and on insurance issues as well. And I will look into that as quickly as possible and hopefully bring back a recommendation in that connection at uh, your July meeting. Well, I was going to, I was going to say the same thing. It, it, it's going to have to be a full-time 365 position. And, you know, what are we going to do with the, our retirees that maybe can't even drive it anymore? That that individual is going to have to be able to travel, and meet with our retirees, possibly at their home, uh, assisted living location. I mean, uh, so I think we got to have that in our in our minds also. Uh, and I I wouldn't vote for this without that in place. I'll just, I'll say that now. Um, they got to have have somebody they can have access to uh, at their convenience to go through all this stuff. Yes, sir. Uh, I guess um, maybe I'm going to call out finance. <laughs> I think at one point, and Mary and Bonnie, y'all can jump on this if I'm incorrect, but I think at some point we were – told I think at the rates that were the increases that we're seeing in health insurance y'all didn't think this was sustainable over a period is that correct at all we we're speaking to the OPEB obligation in out years well. yes ma'am yeah we uh, if you'll recall in the current budget um, you actually started funding it putting additional money into our OPEB obligation the OPEB obligation is simply the liability that we have on the county books because this commitment has been made um, a lot of people will say that Gatsby set a standard and that standard has changed our liability. That's not true. The liability occurred in 1988 <coughs> when the board made a decision to offer this insurance. It's mm -hmm. been there since 1988, um, and we have been um, increasing the number of retirees, which is what we anticipated over that, over that period of time, but we have not been setting aside money for those people. So we have a liability both for those people that have retired, which we pay, on an annual basis, we pay the retiree health insurance, which is about one and a half million dollars a year now. Um, we also have whoever asks how many additional. We have the liability for everyone who has 
um, is eligible and who hasn't retired. And we also have the liability for the other five, six, seven, however many hundred who came to work for this county expecting to get this benefit and who uh, are earning it as they go. The liability is huge. Um, it has been growing every year. And when we were challenged with finding a way to make a win-win solution, what we were first talking about was the county designing its own supplemental Medicare plan. And that's still possible. We can do that. Um, but that will put us, the county, in, the, in charge of deciding how that plan is going to work. Um, and it will not allow the retiree to decide which plan they want. Um, it, can, it can happen, but as Lee points out to me and to many people, pooled health insurance is really not fair. You decide on a, on a set of rules and benefits that you think will meet most of the people's needs, but it doesn't meet everybody's needs. It, does, it never does. This plan, when Lee presented it to us, um, was, was not only cost effective, but it also put the decisions back into the hands of the retirees so they could individually decide which plans met their personal needs. And in the case of Medicare supplemental plans, in the Virginia marketplace, there are a lot of them. I've actually had a couple retirees who are pre-65 come and ask me, well, can I have this plan? And I went to Lee and said, you know, could we do it? And Lee said, yeah, you legally could do, but there are no pre-65, there aren't any great selection of pre-65 insurance plans and it would cost them more. So this only works in this group because it, it is, there are lots of plans available. Right now, we're looking at about a $9 million a year that we need to be putting aside for our OPEB obligation. Um, and that will accrue every, an additional $9 million every year until we have um, a substantial amount of money in, in an OPEB reserve um, to meet the needs of the people that have already retired and those that are earning it. Um, this, this plan is more cost effective because we control, can control the increases. We put the, the uh, choices in the retirees' hands and we can control the increases. Okay. Um, and if we, the whole idea, of grant, we have looked, we have not looked at grandfathering Mr. Skinner for those people, ho whoever are eligible. We looked at, at uh, a couple ways. Um, the $9 million um, obligation, if we grandfather everybody who is working for the county now, which my personal opinion would be, that's what we need to do. But, but we didn't ask that. I, I, I said know you did 10 years out. Yeah, I know that. Okay. Yeah. But, but I'm just saying, in my personal opinion, I know you didn't ask that, but I'm just saying from, I've had this conversation with several people today. Everybody that walked in the door and took a job for this county expected to get this benefit. Even, whether they've earned it or not, they expected it. And so I, I think we have to be careful how we begin to select who we grandfather. That's just my personal opinion. If we grandfather everyone, there is, there's a couple hundred thousand dollars a year but it really, there's not a lot of savings because for 30 years, people are, are still earning this benefit. Um, if we grandfather only those people that are currently retired, um, our obligation drops down a little over $3 million a year. And if we grandfather nobody, it drops down um, over $4 million a year. So there are substantial savings by making the choice, but the choice is yours. Okay, Since so yours. let me get that right. It drops down $3 million if we grandfather everybody? If we grandfather everybody, no, we grandfather everyone, time. there's very minimal change. Okay. A couple, a couple hundred thousand dollars. Okay, that's what I figured. Yes, so there's, because we're keeping everybody on that roll and they're going to earn that benefit. Okay, yes. where's the, where did the three million come? If we, it's 3.4 if we grandfather only the current retirees. So the cost would be 5.6? Mm, about 5.9. 5.9. I'm doing round numbers here, so understand <laughs> and right. if we grandfather nobody if everybody goes on this plan the savings is about 3.9 million dollars a year that's an annual savings okay mr chairman mr marshall go ahead what um since we're talking about grandfather and retirees um mr deskin said 20 29 out of 30 that you said it's financially benefit for them. That's correct. If it's uh, if it's such a benefit, why can't we provide the retirees an option to either stay on this plan that we currently have, or they go with this right. new plan? If this new plan is so right. great, and you, I mean you're the salesman it. for mm -hmm. it, that's a great question. You know, and let's give them the option and let them choose what they would like to do. Here's the answer to the question: If they lose their group health plan involuntarily they get a special enrollment period. They get guaranteed issue plan F. No waiting periods, no questions, no medical questions. Right. If they do not 
involuntarily lose their group plan and have a choice of keeping it. They do not get a special election. And then anyone who wants to do it and can medically qualify for the plan that they apply for could get it. So by making it an option, you will be <clears throat> telling some of the people for sure that they won't be able to leave because they have to medically qualify to be able to leave. Okay. That's the reason. Also, not one other question uh, yeah. from Ms. Moore. The, uh, what would, well, you, <laughs> you may be able to answer this too. Either the one. flexible benefit administrator, mm -hmm. they're going to charge us to do this. That's correct. What would can I can we get that number? Yeah, what they it? have it. I think it's like five dollars uh, per a per retiree oh, okay. or it's four. A charge. Yeah, four fifty or five dollars, something like that. Okay, thanks, Mr. Ross. So, Mary, before you leave, so as I hear things and I, I'm listening very carefully. Uh, you're up close to this, but to me, it's sounding like there's pushback because of the change and because of the uncertainty, which I've already said I can understand. Absolutely. But in, if you're willing to give your opinion and, and maybe a concurrence, it sounds like the proposal that's coming forward is a win-win proposal for the vast majority of our retirees now, the 29 out of 30. I would not want to be the one. Right. Absolutely. And and for future retirees, is that an accurate opinion that I'm getting from what's been presented, that this is a win-win for both retirees and the county? From what Lee has said, which this is a, that's the first I've heard these, but yes, that would that is the case. But the whole idea of of um, having to make a decision and, and needing right. someone to help you is a real there's a real, real thing, thing there. Thing I, there. I, I agree. Absolutely is. I too have a 89 year old mother. Sure. Um, and I would be making these decisions for her. Mm -hmm. That's what would be happening. So um, I hear them. I know. I do too. And, and in the meetings that I've had with the retirees, uh, some of them have come in with their son or with their daughter, and um, and that is the process. And they, the son would say, okay, next year when things change, who's going to be figuring this out? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, when this happened to my father, who retired, and they changed their plan 10 years ago, I did it. And you, yes, you probably will be the one making those decisions. At some point, it's difficult to make decisions as you get older. I, I mean, I recognize that. I, I'm not trying to say that that isn't the case, but I do think there are some good people that can help them with those decisions and, um, and, and help make it as palatable as possible. And, and one follow-on question for you, and I know I'm really putting you on the spot, Mary, mm -hmm. is I, I keep hearing about honoring a commitment made, mm -hmm. and I definitely want to do that. But in your opinion, would this, when it's a win-win, except for the one out of 29, is it, in your opinion, honoring the commitment the county made? I don't have the exact... Okay. Actually, yeah. I have I'm the wording. I'm really putting you on the spot there. Well, no, I, I think we, we, um, we made a commitment to... Um, provide retiree health coverage. And it has changed over the years. At one point it was Key Care 10, and then it was Key Care 20, and now it's Key Care 30. We've made changes. It has not been the exact same plan. Um, but um, you know, if there's anything that concerns me is that I believe the six, and if Mr. McLaughlin was here, I'd say seven of you want to do what's right. And you're going to honor that commitment, and you're going to do that for us. I don't know who the seven people sitting at that podium will be ten years from now. And, and I want to make sure that we make it financially sustainable so that whoever is there says, we can afford to do this, we made a commitment, let's continue it. That's part of my concern, is this is the sustainability of it. And because what we do now is so different than what anybody else does, it is, I think it has a chance, an opportunity for someone to, to bring that up and to make it a concern. And I, as I said before, and I know many of these people have worked with them and love them dearly. Um, I don't want us to lose this benefit. Mm -hmm. I don't want it to be in the hands of someone that, that we don't know 10 years down the road. I just want to do what, and, and, and it's obviously, if you want to grandfather everybody in, that's your choice. And we'll, we'll do the numbers and we'll start setting that money aside. The policy says we have to fund the ARC within six more years, five more years, 2023. 2023 so, and we started it. You did it this year in 19. You will continue to do that. Um, but Mary, we didn't. We did doing it nine million dollars. No, we? you're doing. You did. Uh, you added one point one point two this year, and you'll add another every year until. When we, are we and gonna, once we get when to are that, we going to get hit the nine million mark? 
in so, by 2023. Yeah. So, so what, what you're saying, what I'm hearing is we have an opportunity now if we, if the can gets kicked down the road or it, if we don't, if we grandfather everybody, we could reach a place financially where 10 years from now, a different board m might have to make a decision that does take that commitment away where there is no health care at all. Right. Would that be what you're saying? It yes. concerns me it, yeah. it, because health care is such a big um, conversation in the world right now. Um, and, and the benefit that we have gotten is, is good. It's great. I have to tell you, it made a difference for me. And I have to tell you, and the people that I hire here, the good people that want to come, you know, when salaries are okay, this is a huge benefit. This helps us to hire and retain people. I don't want to see it go away. It's a great benefit, and, and, um, and it just concerns me that we make sure that we sustain the financial responsibility that we have so that we don't put a future board in a position where they feel like they can't have to make that choice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. i got one more question. What, what does our policy say verbatim as far as health insurance to our employees? Um, I can answer that. Um, with the health insurance, if you are hired prior to November of 2007 and you have 10 years of service with the county, um, if you are of full retirement age, then health insurance is available. Outside of that, then it's 20 years um, and um, uninterrupted. Uh, uninterrupted, that's correct. Yeah, that one bit me. <laughs> All right, and then it's, then it's what now? It, there are also percentages based upon years. So if you do not reach that full 20, then there's a different percentages, and I do not have that right in front of me at the moment. But it just says we'll supply health insurance? Is a that percentage a, of the cost. A, but a broad, let's say 20, 20 years uninterrupted. Uh, and, and, and you reach full retirement age, so you have to actually retire. Okay, let's say I've done that. So what, what does the policy say about that specifically as far as? your health insurance that's paid for? It says that health insurance is available. I don't think it provides the specifics. So, so, there's, not, so there's no specifics on what that is dictated to be. Okay. Well, I know as an employee how I'd, I'd read it, but like I say, it's been changed on us before. So, All right. Fine. Dr. Trampy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> I'm open to a lot of possibilities here, a lot of different things we could do. Uh, as has been said, the one thing I'm not willing to do is kick this can down the road any further. Two, two things that were said just now. One is that commitments were made to our employees. The other was no money was set aside until this year. My very first meeting on this board, we faced the same issue with the fire department. It was a $5 million unfunded plan for the fire department, left to me by my predecessors. My seventh year on this board, and I'm still dealing with promises made by my predecessors, unfunded promises made by my predecessors. It's another mess that we have to clean up. So I mean, if they made the promise, why didn't they put money aside? That's my question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Skinner? So, I guess Mary, she's in the back. That's fine. No, stay there, Mary. It's no, it's no big deal. Let, let's really look at the, what I'd like to see is, as uh, Mr. Ross has said, you, we've talked about um, grandfathering everybody. I don't think that's realistic. I really don't. Okay? And I know some people are going to say, well, if I go next 10 years, who's eligible? How many, by the way, how many retirees do we have right now that we're paying for in the county? We're 65 and over. Are you asking for 65 and older specifically? How many retirees do we have? That we're paying for that's not working here anymore, but we're re they're retired. Mary, you can come on up. All retirees who are not eligible in health, who are, who are, hundred. We have hundred and ten um, Medicare, Medicare, and I believe hundred and sixty-eight total 
retirees. It's actually yeah. 180, it might be approaching 185 total, but only 110 are Medicare eligible, but all of those others will be Medicare eligible at some point. Everybody will get to that oh, point. Uh, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Okay. Mm -hmm. <coughs> no, because once they hit 65, yes, sir. Right. then they're going to turn over to that new system and everything. So currently we're paying, um, is there an estimate how much once these people turn 65 are going to cost us? Because it's going to be a continuous thing. Up until a point that we set a point saying, sorry, if 10 years out, if you're eligible within the next 10 years to retire, we need to know what those figures are. And I'm not saying we can grandfather every play, but it's not, it's, that's not uh, logical, I think. But we can retire people who have been here and are close to retirement to making sure that they get. And even though you say 29 out of 30 was financially better, and, and I agree with you, it is, but uh, <laughs> making that decision and stuff of that nature, and I just would like, like uh, Mr. Marshall said up here, let's look at giving them the option. If of those 29 people, that or 30 people you interviewed, were all 29 saying, yes, it was beneficial, or you just said you told them it was beneficial to them, and how many of those people realize it and would take that? that that's a good question. Uh, on the finance side, they saw how the cost, their cost, was better. I would say probably 50% of them were concerned that it was difficult to think about making these changes. So 15, mm -hmm. and, and then I had, you know, I had a number of people that were going to be significantly better off financially. They had a spouse with them who they understood how that worked, and, and they were excited about it. So... Um, so there, there definitely are people concerned about how difficult it is. I'm not going to tell you that, that there aren't. Um, and there may be um, ways to address some of that. Uh, like, for example, you can't give them the option of staying on or not staying on because then they won't be able to get on the Plan F uh, if they have any medical conditions. What you could do, though, is you could say, for example, Anyone 80 or over can stay on, will stay on the plan, and anyone under 80 will not stay on the plan. So you could pick an age limit, and then every, if you're under that age, you get the special election. If you're not under that age, you don't. Um, and that would provide more savings than if you just said current retirees have to stay on the plan and the others don't. There, but that, that would be one way to, you know, to address having especially the, your older retiree population who will find it difficult f to have this change, they wouldn't have to have to make the change. So that might be a solution. I mean, and whether it's 80 or 75, I don't know. Uh, and again, the people that I've spoken with, I, you know, uh, maybe they'll contact you and let you know why they would like to see this plan, you know, if that made sense. Um, so, you keep talking about the um, if if they if they're grandfathered in, and then they lose their group. You said they. Well, what's concerning to me, and maybe I misunderstand what you're saying, is that the disadvantage of these people being grandfathered and staying on the current health care program. There's no no disadvantage uh, as long as they want to stay on the current health plan. They won't be able to go to this other plan be, if they medically don't qualify because they don't medically qualify and they would be asked medical questions if they have the option of staying on a group plan. Okay, so they decide to stay in this group plan. Right. It's worked for the first 10 years. Yeah, and it's fine, worked, and that's fine. fine, but, and you keep saying they don't have the option, they don't have the option to go to the new plan. Well, well, for and example, so once you okay, uh, one of the individuals that I spoke with uh, was 81 years old, uh, and um, she was excited about the new plan. Okay, so I, you know, everybody isn't disappointed. She mm -hmm. was excited about it. Now, if you cut, if you if you say at 80, um, they have to stay on the existing plan, then she won't have the option to go to the other plan. And if you say, well, you can if you medically qualify, then you'll we'll have to find out whether she medically qualifies if she's, that, I mean, that's, we don't have medical qualifications if 
um, if the person does not have the option of staying on the current plan. That, that's my point. And, and so if you give them the option to stay on the current plan, um, they're going to have to stay on the current plan whether they want to or not, probably. Okay. That, that's all I'm saying. Okay. So uh, if, you, if you would, please just, you know, figure something out. Like you said, I, I, I like those options, but I want the current employees that are certainly retired to have a choice. Either be grandfathered with their grand, if they're comfortable with that, then that's not our fault if it comes down to there. You've explained everything to everybody, and when they make that decision, I think it would be very important to make sure they understand what the consequences are staying on the old plan, grandfathering it, and continue on, okay? I, that's what you needed. I mean, I need help sometimes myself understand things. And it, always a change is tough. Is very tough, and not knowing the financial aspect of it. Okay, I appreciate your work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yakubowski. Thank you. So I'm sitting here, and I'm the second youngest on the board, <laughs> Mr. Marshall. Um, and I find all this confusing, and um, I, I'm I, I understand the the financial obligations that we have, and and I want to leave a better um, county government when I leave than when I showed up. And there are decisions like this that have to be made. And so w what I look for is what is the least um, problematic for um, especially those who are, are older. Um, I, I know that there are examples of, you know, kids helping parents do this, and you know, but the, you will have those people that will fall through the cracks. And so Answer me this, if this is possible, because, um, and, and if you can explain it in layman's terms, I'd appreciate it. The current retirees that we have, if they get left as is, and Mr. Skinner had said about a 10-year uh, limit or, or go back 10 years, or people that are 10 years or, or so from retirement age, well, is there a problem with having a system where current retirees that are in the system stay, but everybody who's coming up will then have the option? Can you do that? And then, at, and then how does that help the numbers? Uh, it, it, and now those are two different questions. Can you do it? Yes. Uh, if, if there's a $9 million um, liability, and by doing that, you get $100,000 savings, you can do that. That's well, just the problem. You're not going to get a $5 million savings or $4 million or $3 million savings. Well, right, right. And that, that's a positive decision that, that we right. have to make. If, if we want to you know, that's put out the $9 million, then we'll, we'll right. find a way to put exactly. it out. Exactly. But what, what I'm asking is that if the, if the people that are coming up to retirement, if we don't have to go back 10 years and automatically throw them into the new plan, but give the choice there, because if, if it's financially um, beneficial for the majority of people that are currently retired, but the drawback is the, um, the change and the, the added pressure that you would have by doing something that uh, folks you know have been used to doing something different, that the people that are approaching that then would get the choice of, of, of picking it as opposed to being thrown into it. And so if we can find out what that number would be, perhaps we can merge into this a little bit easier than having to jump into it completely and find that middle ground where, yes, our OPEB will be $5 million a year or $6 million or $7 million, whatever it might be, but it will be a reduction. And perhaps that if this new program is as beneficial as – as it supposedly will be, then people that have um, not made that choice then could actually jump into it realizing what a benefit it is uh, because there's the track record of it and then the savings for the county will come as more people see it. And so more of a, a trial as it, as it goes along and, and, and explaining it to people. So that's all. Thank you. Well, I'm just going to, I've spoken to, I think, five retirees now, none of which have contacted you that I'm aware of. Okay. One, one said she's not. The one that said she's not, 
when I asked if she was interested in a savings or if she if she could save two or four hundred dollars, would she be interested? Nope. No. And I mean, I I don't know how to <laughs> uh, raise property taxes, raise real estate, and people go crazy. And if you a chance to save out- two or four hundred dollars or more a a year or a month, and I don't. I don't know how you argue that. I, so I guess I'm just venting a little bit. But I do understand the age thing. I, I, I believe me. Every year it goes by, more bones creak, and I'm wondering what's going to give up first: my shoulder or my knees. Um, I just. I don't know. I, people are so reluctant to change into trying something that could possibly be very beneficial in the long run, or immediately. And just because it's changed, don't want to even consider it. Uh, we've got some hard decisions to make here in the near future, I'm sure. A lot to consider. I guess we'll have to get wait for some information from finance back on some things. But anyway, thank you for your presentation. Unless anybody has any more comments or Mr. Ross. So when is this coming back? Mr. Taylor. To bring back in July information on the uh, possibility of a position in HR that would help facilitate, coach, or assist with information um, to help retirees understand uh, uh, parameters. And we have a well, we have series would that of be questions. up for yeah. You know, we got some questions to get answered right in we'll July meeting when you present that. Would we be up for decision making at that time or? I believe a decision would be required at that time, but it would be. To rerun the numbers for the people that qualify in the next 10 years, my staff can't do that. We have to go out and have that done. So, right. uh, and I'm not sure the timing of that. The lat- When we had them run the series of numbers, it took several weeks. Um, right. They have all the data. It may take a couple weeks. So um, it, actuarial analysis is, is very complicated, and um, we'd have to right. find out that data. But well, so was there a question you. on the cost or savings for that pool or simply uh, Mr. Skinner's questions were focused at how many retire? We 10 years. If you're eligible for eligible retirement, it's another 10 years 10 or 15 years, years before right. you hit So I, I thought those 65, questions were so. just to identifying the pool, not to looking at what the savings okay. would That's be fine. if we took that direction. I'd be interested in what's, who's available now as far as grandfathering. Just the number of people. That, yeah, right. I can't. I'm saying, as far as the numbers to where that nine million dollar goes, if we change that, I can't do that without contacting with a. Right, co- that's an actuarial it's question. An actuarial right. It's far yes. more. <coughs> but it can complex. be done. I just need right. to know. Right, but the it takes time. Mm-hmm. Right, that but, was your your question. Right, and and I know staff was taking notes on them, so I don't think I have to re ask my question, <laughs> but I, I I do want to kind of know that because I think that there is is that that path that we can look at that it's it's going to cost more we all know that we we are going to have to put money more money into this but if you don't do something about it we know what it's going to be but at what point what is what is that sweet spot that we can hit where you know perhaps the people that are currently uh, retired are are left alone and we don't we don't touch that but people that are coming up they have a choice and th- and that's what i really think needs to be shown that you know, you, you need a trial of this, I, and, and nothing against you whatsoever. You, you know, there have been many times that health insurance changes have been promised to make everything better, and I know our premiums have gone up, and they haven't gone down twenty five hundred a year that was promised. So, you know, having having a bit of a, a trial with still that 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 um, comfort zone of the plan that you know and love sort of sitting there as you move along and you pull it away slowly, I think might be a better way of doing it than just say, here it is, it's the end, either you do it or you don't. That might just be a better way. And I don't know what those numbers might be. And if those numbers don't make sense, then we don't do that. But if they do... It would be much easier to run it at anybody that qualifies within the next year, 10 years, stays, and everybody else just automatically goes off. That's an easy, easier number to run. Um, if we start talking about choices, then we have to make assumptions on who's going to choose what. So well, it is, there is some, um, but, but it can, can be done. You can do a percentage, you know, right, if right. we have well, 10, we would, 20, you know, that we'll type. We'll make it, yeah. But uh, what I'm hearing Lee say, which worries me about the choice, is that if there is a choice put into this equation, then they do not automatically medically qualify. 
So for right. many of them, because at that age they have medical conditions, they're not going to have a choice. They're not going to qualify for the other plan. They're going to have to stay on the current one. And so, but if we say you have to go to this plan, then they, we're not giving them any choice. They automatically medically qualify. There's no medical qualifications involved. Um, so we, so we, if we give them a choice, it sounds like we're doing something good, but we're really taking the choice out of their hands. Totally, because because for many of them, they're not they're not going to medically qualify. Well, and, and but that's not our fault. I mean, it, to say either you have it or you don't, um, or giving them the choice and then they don't qualify, that's not our fault. No, it's not. But it, but no. what it could be is a three tiered system where the retirees are left. Then you have that period until people that are ten years away have the choice whether they qualify or not is up to what uh, situations and then the 10 year period and back is there is no choice it's it's done away with and we will have that 10 years of history to show how beneficial this plan is anyway so i don't think you will have people most people 10 years away from retirement at that point uh, worried about it because you can see 10 years of beneficial uh, product plus it's um you have 10 years to to plan toward or to move towards that and you're not being having something changed on you while you're in it. Well, and one more point to make, because um, I, I think many people are, will be in this situation like I will. When I retire, I will not be 65. So I will be, there will be 10 more years on the current plan before I'll even be thinking about this. So you know, if I can retire, you, know, you may retire in, within the next 10 years and have another 10 years before you are part right. of this plan. So yep. just something to, to keep in mind. Mr. Chairman, real quick, the age Marshall. age age requirement of 65 is an automatic qualification. So if we grandfather the current retirees and then give the current employees that option that you're talking of, I, I understand she she's not going to be able to provide us that number because you don't know who's going to take what. But I, I agree with you 100% on that. It's an easy way to, to move into it, I right. would think. Yeah. But we have to move into something. Right. The 10-year requirement is, is – that doesn't matter on that because they'll have, you know, 65 is the age where you get it or not. So, okay. Mr. Deskins, will you keep us updated as often as possible as far as any other retirees that you speak to by phone, I'm assuming? Or are you going to have planned any more meetings? I, I haven't at this point scheduled any additional meetings. We will see whether that is something that needs to happen. I know there were a few people that I committed that I would meet with them if they wanted to have a personal meeting, uh, and I will do that. Okay. Um, I have worked with a lot of people on the phone, and that has, you know, been been pretty productive. I mean, I think that's worked out well right. too. I don't know whether we. <laughs> I'm trying to think how I can word this without being taken the wrong way. But maybe uh, maybe some ones that are going to see the savings, or that are, will you've shown will have savings, and uh, will maybe be not as happy spending two, three, four on up more money than what they need to at this time. Maybe we should encourage them to come to the board meeting and reach out to their supervisors because, like I say, I've heard from about five, none of which have gone to speak to you. <laughs> All of which don't care whether they have a million dollars savings. Right. It's uh, concerning that they simply change. And uh, so I'll just leave that. If you could just update us, though, if you get sure. more folks with savings and, and or keep, not. I'll keep Leslie informed of what's going on, and she'll keep. <laughs> okay. Rest. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. I guess you are excused. Thank you for your yeah, you presentation. You. Next, Carl has a presentation to bring forward on draft amendments to the Board of Supervisors bylaws relating to special meeting agendas and public presentations at special meetings. This is the item requested by Mr. Skinner. No, no, let's just push on it. Craig? 
Okay. That's okay. Well, that's the thing. If you if you tell them they got five more minutes, then they'll talk oh, ten. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Just get them out. All right. All right, Mr. Chair, members of the board, um, as Mr. Taylor explained, uh, this is uh, me coming back to you all um, pursuant to Mr. Skinner's request to address the bylaws related to uh, special meetings. Um, that is just the title page. Um, go over to option. I've come to you with two options. Um, just to uh, set the two options up, uh, the board calls special meetings generally in, in uh, one of two ways. Um, relatively more frequently, uh, you all, as sitting as a, uh, a group here, uh, vote to set a special meeting between uh, the seven of you. Uh, the other way that it happens outside of a regular meeting um, is that uh, either two of you or the chair can call a special meeting. Um, usually that happens in cases where there's uh, something very, very timely uh, concerned, uh, something related to a, a contract that has to get approved or uh, something's going to expire or some cost saving is going gonna, is gonna to be lost or sometimes there's a legal matter, uh, maybe a, a litigation matter that is also timely. Uh, where we might need to update you on something in closed session um, and after which you may have to come out and act. Um, so option one here uh, I think addresses uh, the issue that I think uh, Mr. Skinner took exception to. Um, uh, the issue was was that there was a, a special meeting set at a regular meeting by you all um, rather than being set or called by the chair just two individuals outside of a regular meeting. Um, after that uh, meeting was, was set there were additions to the agenda um, after it was set at the meeting um, before it, it came uh, to the meeting date. So what this uh, option one does, uh, it addresses that uh, situation. Um, and if you would click through the next one. Um, this addresses uh, at any regular meeting when you all vote, you know, as a board to set the agenda for the special meeting, that that agenda will not change um, as it goes uh, to the next meeting. This does not limit uh, public presentations. However, it would limit it if you don't set it at that initial meeting. So when you set your agenda at that regular meeting, if you all you know, included a public presentations period, that would carry through and be part of the special meeting agenda. Um, this retains the flexibility for those uh, meetings to be called you know, with the, uh, the two supervisors or the chair. Um, it doesn't address those. This, this addresses just the specific circumstance that I believe uh, Mr. Uh, Skinner was concerned with. If you would click through to the, uh, the second option. The second option addresses specifically what Mr. Uh, Skinner requested at the meeting. Um, this, uh, with respect to any special meeting, regardless how, of how it's called, nothing that is, is not in that notice uh, can be considered at the special meeting when it comes about. Uh, and also, it re uh, removes uh, any public presentation period at a special meeting. It prevents that. And that was pursuant to Mr. Skinner's direct request. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, that's that. Uh, you see Section C there that no public presentation shall be allowed. Um, so those are the two options. Um, and I leave that for uh, discussion and any questions that you might have. Any discussion, comments, Mr. Skinner? Yeah. The reason I brought this up is I'm not against special meetings, okay? And we usually call them, if you've looked in the past, our special meetings have a subject that we need to decide on, and that's why we call them. And all I'm saying is I don't mind coming in for a special meeting, but it should be even, I would even go as far as saying that if somebody wants to give a public presentation or a three-minute on the subject, I, I could probably live with that, but I'm saying... Uh, okay, we have a special meeting on an ordinance here, 
and we open it up to the public. Somebody comes in and talks about the road. Somebody talks about, let's say, a baseball stadium, which we know it's not going to happen. But <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just saying is that I believe a special meeting is called to answer the questions or solve the problems that we have in that specific area that we were called a special meeting for. And I, I don't think um, we need to highlight any other things that's going on in this county. I, I think we need to call the business to order and we need to get going and doing it. Uh, I do not ever remember, number one, that we had a special meeting that we opened it up other than the last one we had, okay? And I found that very, um, well, wasteful. To be honest with you, we're here to do the job on a specific issue that I was meeting, and I, I would say that's the way we called it, and I would like to keep it that way. And I'm not against public opinion, all right? But most of the special issues are called for, and the public don't even know about it until we, we advertise it very quickly, okay? And it, seriously, if, some, if a public member has something that's really germane to the issue that we have, I don't mind listening to them. But any issue out there shouldn't be held at a, at a public hearing, at a special meeting. That's something certainly I can draft up if that's the direction the board wants to go. But obviously, I would want you know, the board's direction to be. Carl? Mr. Chair. Oh, yes. So you're saying that you can draft something up that would allow people to come in and speak on something specific to what the special meeting is about, but not anything else? That's yes. what I think that's what Mr. Skinner is saying. Yes, I, I, I can draft that up. Is, um, that, is that legal? It is legal. Uh, the public, um, uh, public meetings here are not traditional public forums. <clears throat> um, you, you all actually don't have to have public presentations at all if you choose not to. Um, there has been, I, I will tell you that there has been um, movement in the General Assembly or, or bills introduced the last couple of years to actually require uh, public comment <clears throat> at every single public meeting, no matter which body um, holds it. That hasn't been adopted yet, but there is a movement towards that. But yes, we, we could craft something up to limit what the subject matter is that they can speak to. Well, if I, if I may, I, I mean, I came on the board, uh, our first meeting of the month was at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, <clears throat> and we had one public presentation time, which I think was 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and I'm talking about normal meetings. And since I've been on the board, and I think, you know, we have moved our first meeting back to 4.30 <clears throat> of the month, and the second one is at 6, but we still, we, we've, we've become a more transparent board and a more open board. Uh, we now have public presentations at both 4.30 and 6 o'clock. And I would never, ever say, in my opinion, hearing from the citizens on whatever they want to talk about. As a matter of fact, in my opinion, we get too little citizen feedback. We get too little citizen uh, input at, at the board meetings. I wish more people would come out. Uh, and I think citizen involvement in local government is important. Um, so what I've seen is that we've opened up that door to get more to make more availability. A three o'clock in the afternoon meeting, it's very hard for people that work or commute up north to make that. We've opened that up so that uh, you can also speak at public presentations at six o'clock. And hearing from our citizens is never a waste of time. It's never a waste of my time. Uh, I don't see how it could be a waste of time. Uh, we have very little meetings. I, I mean, I spend more meetings at, at FAMPO or the library board or other boards than, than the then here we meet twice a month and sometimes only once. And I'm just, I don't think anything's broken. I don't think anything needs to be fixed. Um, I, I wanna hear from the public, whether we're talking about taxes or we're talking about whatever our special meeting might need to be called for. Uh, and I, I would actually support option one, although I don't think there's a need to be changed, if the default were that public presentation, if we, if we call a special meeting of, of the board without the two members calling it, that the default would be public presentation is going to be there unless otherwise stated when it's called. So. Any other call? Mr. Yakubowski. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I would support having a public presentation time that's germane to the question in front of us. A special meeting is only called as they're called special meetings. So they, uh, how many have we had in the past four or five years? You know, a handful, if that. Um, so I, I don't, I don't know why we would have to have a public presentation time 
usually when a special meeting is called anyway, it's a short time period anyway. So it's not as though we are limiting public presentation time during any other typical meeting. And so I think that special meetings are called for a specific reason, a specific issue. Um, it comes to mind with the uh, baseball uh, stadium um, presentation. It was a, a quick one. We did a uh, public or a special meeting on that, and we had public comment on the issue that was before us. And that was completely uh, the right thing to do and the right way to do it. But if we would have had people showing up and talking about potholes and other issues, you know, I, I don't understand how that is uh, pertinent to the conversation that we called this meeting specifically to address. So I would like to see it that it is germane to the topic in front of us. Um, but I also would like to see that if, if um, we had the option of when the meeting is called that we could add a public presentation time if we wanted to that would not be germane to the to the topic in front of us and and just let me clarify the uh the the need to go back and draft something would be only with respect to option two currently with option one um where you have the ability to set the agenda you know at your regular meeting when you when you set that meeting um it, it will be you know at your discretion to say you know I would we want to have a public presentation and you can have it not limited or at that time you could say we would like to have a public presentation um, but we think this is a singular subject and we want to limit public presentations to that subject so you, you have the option under number one to, to do that currently I don't have to go back and redraft anything it will be just at each time at the board's discretion so if there's you know a majority of you that uh, want to have a public presentation open or if there's a majority of you that want to limit public presentation that's okay and if you want to have no public presentation it will always be at the majority of the board's uh, discretion under option one Go ahead. Well, you know a lot of times when we call these special meetings and again they're not that often uh, the discussion of having a public presentation time or not is probably not something that's on the foremost of our of our minds or the forefront of our minds so if, if we need to do that, I think we need to add to that that we would discuss if a public, if a special meeting is called at our board meeting, that part of that calling would require a decision on public presentation or not. Is that possible? I could include something there. I think certainly I now have a heightened awareness, and as does, I'm sure, Mr. Taylor. So to the extent that a special meeting does get called in the future with, with these provisions in it, I would certainly bring it to the board's attention to say, you know, you know, well, does the board? You would, but you're, you know, you're ten years from now, twenty years from now, you won't be here. And I think I will just say from the last one, it, you know, we probably didn't think about it. Right? Certainly, I understand, and I can and certainly I, include. And I didn't something. think about it until I looked at the agenda and saw sure. it wasn't there. Sure. So. No, I, we can certainly include something that um, uh, that we uh, there's a requirement that uh, the the, the uh, clerk. <laughs> Uh, recommend to the board or bring to the board's attention the option for a public presentation. We can, we can, I can certainly draft something in there. Mr. Marshall. I, I, by all means, I think I, I agree with what you're saying, but I think it's already covered in option one. We have to set an agenda for a special meeting, and that's public presentation is part of that agenda when you go to set it. I think option one covers what everybody wants to do here. It gives you, it's, it's laid out to give you the option if you want public presentation or not during a special meeting. Uh, when you set that agenda during the regular meeting, I think everything everything everyone's saying is, is covered in option one. Carl, if there's a legislation or change in Richmond like you t insinuated there might possibly be, I guess in the future, about where at every public meeting there would be a presentation, would that null and void any, any kind of... <laughs> Of course, that would supersede your bylaws. So, okay. um, you know, we would you know want to clean up the bylaws so that requirement's not in there. But we would you know undertake uh, efforts to ensure that there is that public presentation period at every single meeting. Right. Well, I just suggest to the board that we keep it as is. If we already have the authority to change our, I mean, to uh, amend our public presentations to a specific topic at a special meeting, there's no need to change anything. So. I'd make a motion that we keep it as is since we already have the uh, ability to, to, to modify our public comment. I don't think you have to make that motion. Or do we, do we even need a motion? You, you don't have to make a motion. If there's an absence of motion, it will just stay the same. Yeah, okay. 
I'm fine with it staying. Mr. Skinner. So if we say the same, we can come up here and call a special meeting and listen to anything. We say, okay, at that agenda, at that special meeting, is going to be a public presentation, and anybody and everybody can come here and comment about something that that special meeting is at a call. What I understand is then the majority of this vote, of this board would vote to the agenda would consist of public hearing and keep it germane to the issue that we're sitting here for and that would you're telling me that's what we would have to do under what we've got right now under what you've got right now you would call a special meeting and you would set the agenda um, as you desire with public presentation or a limited public presentation um, what it what it does allow though and under the Virginia Code, it allows you the flexibility, which option one takes away, that if there's an, a matter where you all come in, you're all here present, and there's a matter that you want to add to it, um, the state code does give you the flexibility to, if you're all here, if you want to talk about something, you can talk about it. And that's what happened at the la last one, Mr. Skinner. Um, you know, there was a, a, an item added um, with respect to public presentation that, you know, or, or a couple things that were added. Um, that weren't on the original noticed agenda. But because you were all here and could vote on it, that's what happened. So a majority of you voted to have that public presentation. Um, that's what, what you took exception with, that you know they were able to vote even though it wasn't on the previous agenda, even though it's allowed by law. So option one takes, a, takes that flexibility away. I so if it, if, if it stays now, you, could, you would still have the circumstance that you uh, took exception to earlier, that if everybody's here and wanted to add something to the agenda, you, you could do that if there's seven people here and there's a majority vote. So that's really the only difference, you know, with option one and what uh, currently um, sits now is to address that issue. So if we set the agenda at this meeting, like we call a special meeting next week, okay, we set the agenda, but yet when we come back to that special meeting, we have the authority to change it with different subjects if they want to be added to it. Ab so absolutely. what you have in is a regular meeting. A regular meeting is what you're trying to do. I, I, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm more than happy to listen to any person out there speak on the issue that we're trying to solve. And I think it's taking advantage of members if when you come in here, you know you have a specific thing, and then all of a sudden now you're dealing with two and three other subjects. Hold it. Let's not even hold it anymore and just add it on to the next agenda. That's, that's as far as my Chair. concern is. Mr. Ross. M Mr. Skinner, if I may just address, you, you would still need a majority vote. So, I mean, you still need four members to vote for anything that we would add. So it's not taking the disadvantage of members when the majority would still be required to vote on this. What, that's your opinion. I figure when somebody calls me and says, I'm coming to this meeting for this subject, and then all of a sudden now there's the bullpen action. This is what we're getting into now. We're going to have two or three bullpens in there beginning and say, we want to amend the agenda, and we want to add these to the, to the agenda. And that's what, that's what we can do. Right, that's and that's a, not a special meeting. That's, that's a regular weekly meeting. Or if the majority votes that down, they vote it down. It's the majority of the board that collectively decides what's on the agenda as we are now. I don't see an issue with it. I brought my point out. That's fine. Whatever you want to do. Thank you, Carl. Thank you. All right. Then we have corrections and follow-up comments from Board of Supervisors and School Board Joint Work Session. Mr. Chairman, uh, Budget Manager Bonnie Jewell is here to or, uh, provide a short presentation. When the Board met jointly with the School Board on May 29th of this year, uh, there was certain information brought forward by the uh, School Board uh, staff that our finance staff had not uh, gotten to see prior to the meeting, and there are a, a difference of view on some of the financial uh, points or uh, statistics that were brought forward. I want the board to know is the, the finance folks, uh, ladies are setting up here. I have um, since also um, discussed with Dr. Baker the uh, practice and the desirability of bringing forward information for public presentation by either of our staffs in advance, ensuring in advance, so that we avoid 
the situation of having uh, information presented by uh, one staff that the other staff is not aware of in advance and hasn't had an opportunity to collaborate about. We are taking seriously the, the board's charge and the school board's charge at that same meeting that we should uh, look at collaborative operations going forward and one of the basic things we're doing is committing to uh, share information in advance and work together better to pr make sure that we're providing accurate information. Uh, the, in, particularly when it comes forward in public uh, to one or both boards. Mr. Chairman, if I might. Mr. Yakovask. Um, school staff provided this information that we're now fact checking? Because I don't remember school staff providing any of this stuff. I remember this being certain school board members that made statements that we're now fact checking. Now, there was information, and I believe uh, Ms. Jewell can speak to this in greater depth, but there was information presented um, first by uh, Ms. Gaines, the CFO of the uh, school division, uh, making observations about uh, certain uh, financial data. Well, I, I would just say that the very first one up here was actually a school board member said this. Uh, and if, if school staff said that, I completely missed it, but I know that they had said it. And so my question would be, why are we fact-checking board members? Because if we are, uh, are we going to fact-check ourselves? And if we're going to fact-check ourselves, did we ever fact-check the reason that we were even at the special meeting, that there were allegations made that there was found money? You know, this, this, this I, I'm not understanding, I've never in my life seen this before of other elected officials that come and, and talk to us being fact-checked by us in such a way that what they said is actually true, but it could be interpreted wrong, so let's <coughs> set the record straight. I, I don't know why we're doing that, because I, if that was done to me by the other board, I would find that very insulting, and I don't know why we would be doing that. Now, if somebody, and, and I'm included in this, is speaking, and I use a wrong uh, word or a wrong number, um, that is fine to correct what those are, but somebody's intent and what they're trying to, to point out, I don't know why we would be fact-checking them, and this is unprecedented to do this uh, beyond um, what county staff, or I'm sorry, school staff has has put forward if it was a handout or a a, um, a presentation that they made. So if we want to correct the record, that's fine, but I don't feel comfortable correcting other board members and their, uh, meaning the, the school board members and their opinions that they might have, uh, because especially in, in the uh, first question, uh, what they had stated was accurate. It's just there's an, uh, a different way that you can take those numbers to get a better view of of the situation and that's not what they were doing and i don't feel comfortable going ahead and and correcting them when they're not even here to defend themselves on the on the timing piece last mentioned in your comment mr yakubowski if i may the understand that the intent and the original uh, schedule was to bring this information forward uh, when the bodies were together jointly as was planned for the 26th two days ago, we would be uh, and had been had the thought when the school board uh, advised us that they could not be present this week, the thought was to hold this information for uh, the next joint gathering of the bodies. However, a uh, board member requested that the information be brought forward uh, sooner for, to clarify the information for the public. And uh, personally, I would say there's no uh, intent that I'm aware of on the staff's part to correct any elected official. There was fundamentally the representation that was brought forward by the uh, school staff at that uh, meeting concerning, I believe it was the uh, portion of new uh, 
county money that was coming to the division in the FY19 budget, and that was a, a point that gave rise to effort by the budget manager even during the meeting um, who was, uh, and we struggled to access the system and reach the answer within the time frame of the joint meeting. Uh, and were unable to do so, and so the information was compiled subsequent to the meeting, and again, the intent was to bring it back when the bodies were together. Well, I think that uh, would make more sense that then we can then educate the school board and their staff about the misconceptions, if there are some out there, of the different facts. Um, doing it now uh, without them present, I don't feel is the proper way to do it, um, especially if, as my recollection I think is correct, um, the number the first one was not a, uh, a staff member, but a board member that had um, brought it forward. And like I said, and I'll, I'll repeat, I don't like fact-checking each other um, because if we're not going to fact-check everything that was said at that meeting, then we shouldn't pick and choose what we do fact-check. So I would actually ask if we could move this to our joint meeting with the school board so that we could then have a further discussion about these issues that are before us. Well, I'll, I'll speak briefly. I actually kind of agree with you, Mr. Yakupowski. I, I did question when this was brought up that was going to be on the agenda. I wanted to make sure that, uh, number one, Mr. Baker and the school board were aware and also uh, had the information that we were going to be discussing. So they do, according to Mr. Taylor, they have had that discussion. They are aware of the intended discussion tonight. Um, so that was my concern. I didn't want to do something where they had done some things and then we're just going to come out here and blurt something opposite. I don't know. It didn't really bother me too much. But anyway, I have also, just to let you know, also I've requested that Mr. Taylor have one of our finance staff uh, with us as they have LaShawn when we do our joint meetings because uh, – I think it's only fair in that way if there's some rebuttal that is needed, you know, uh, the finance staff can, one or both can stand up and or, or voice their concerns about what is being said so we have accurate information on both ends. But I'm fine with continuing it to the other, to the next joint meeting. I don't, it doesn't matter to me. I, we can do it now since they've already been told and notified of it. It's not going to be a, I don't, it should not be a surprise of any discussion we have tonight. Uh, I did make sure of that. Mr. Ross, you have some? Yeah, oh, sure, Mr. Chair. I, I don't see this as fact checking at all. I, I see this as uh, statements that were made uh, at our meeting that weren't contested. <coughs> I took them for what they were worth, which I took them at, at, at face value that they were true. Uh, our staff subsequently sent something out that said, no, uh, not, not so accurate, or maybe a different way to interpret it. And uh, I'm fine with pushing this to when we meet with the school board. I think it'd be great. But I would say everybody on this board saw the agenda, saw this agenda item seven days prior to this meeting, and I think we unanimously approved our agenda. Uh, I'm happy to go home. It's my wife's birthday. I'd be happy to see her in, in a little bit earlier tonight than, uh, than normal. Uh, so I, I'm fine if we want to table this till we uh, next meet with the school board. Again, it's not a fact check, but we need, we owe our community, we owe the public if something's said here, I mean, I know the, the news follows what we do. The you know, Freelance Star checks on our meetings, and if something's said and it's not contested, or if it's inaccurate, we need to set the record straight. Don't take it the wrong way. It's not a public uh, uh, hit on anybody that said it. It's just, you know, things are said. Staff, staff does make mistakes from time to time. I make mistakes from time to time, and if I make a mistake, I'd want it to be corrected. If I say something that's not accurate, I want it to be corrected, and we owe the public to correct the record. And that's, uh, that's all I've got to say. So I can make a motion that we table this until our next school board meeting, joint school board, which I don't know, is there a date set for that? In August. In, In August. August uh, I do think uh, by that time we might not even remember what this was all about, and that's why I kind of wanted to talk about it tonight, to set the record straight tonight. But okay, let's push it, push it till August. I'm in favor to table it until the next meeting with the school board. Any other comments? Hmm? Doesn't matter to me. So. 
We can vote a uh, motion by Mr. Ross to table until our next joint meeting sometime in August. Motion passes 6-0. Mary, Bonnie, Sarda, you've wasted your time in the evening. All about interpretation. Mr. Chairman, we do have a short closed session item. No, no I don't think okay. we do. I'm sorry, that's right. We, do, we have a new business item. We also do have a closed session item um, for discussion, but the... the um, I didn't think we had a closed session meeting. I'm sorry, I thought Item. that you had coordinated with that. Tom, I apologize. We'll do that next month. Do have a, a matter of uh, new business board members, and that is uh, the approval of a uh, incentive agreement um, regarding uh, Patriot Three, which is a. Uh, <coughs> expanding the business in the county. The board was briefed on Patriot 3's expansion and the incentive agreement back in January, and it's taken some time to work out the particulars. This agreement has been approved publicly by the EDA, so we're advised it's no longer appropriate for discussion in closed meeting, um, but would ask the board at this time to take action to approve the performance agreement um, with the date of agreement being June 28th, um, being today, and this is an agreement between the County of Spotsylvania, Virginia, and Patriot 3, Inc., a Delaware corporation licensed to do business in the Commonwealth of Virginia. The company is engaged in the business of providing specialized equipment for special forces and law enforcement worldwide. They currently employ 28 full-time employees in Spotsylvania County, and they are intending to make an additional capital investment in excess of $2 million to expand their principal business operations by an addition of 25,000 additional square feet and to create at least eight new full-time jobs and an average salary of $56,000 a year uh, by the end of this calendar year um, 2018, the agreement provides um, uh, they will also um, make additional personal property investment of $150,000 and they will receive back incentive uh, grants from the county uh, equal to 40% of their uh, BPOL uh, taxes uh, in a, up to a cap of $70,000. They will also have a personal property incentive grant uh, capped at $43,000 and this uh, and a permit grant uh, capped at $5,000 and this set of incentives falls within the guidelines for incentives that have guided the board's economic development incentive decisions um, for the last uh, couple of years. With that, would ask for a motion to approve the performance agreement with Patriot 3, Inc. So moved. Got a motion to approve by Mr. Yakbaski. Motion passes 5-0 with Mr. McLaughlin and Mr. Ross being absent. That is all we have, Mr. Chairman, and we'll hope to see everyone at the Stars and Stripes on Saturday afternoon starting at 3. Right. Motion to adjourn. Now I keep on hitting this thing, and it keeps on... I mean, it should be. Five zero. Yeah,